All right, now that we have that little bit of housekeeping out of the way, um, I want to sincerely thank you for being here today. My name is Dr. Vida Robertson, and I am the director of the Center for Critical Race Studies. And on behalf of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences and the Center for Critical Race Studies and the fellows that empower it, we want to sincerely thank you for being here today. I have the distinguished pleasure of, uh, of introducing you to two amazing men. Uh, the first one, of course, is uh, the president of our university. He is an amazing scholar in his own right, an incredible leader uh, in the time that he's been with us. And he would like to come forth at this time and welcome all of you from the community, from our classrooms, from uh, our very city to this beautiful moment. So ladies and gentlemen, a warm round of applause for our president, Dr. <laughs> Olivas. <laughs> oh, my brother. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Robertson, thank you so very much for the invitation. As is happening much more often in my life these days, I, I am double parked already tonight. I have <laughs> two more events tonight to go to to try and fly the flag uh, here for, for your interest at UHD. Uh, I will say that uh, one of the wonderful blessings of many that I've had is to, uh, to learn not only more about this institution where I've had uh, family members who've attended and so where some of my students teach and, and, uh, and which I've driven by like many other Houstonians many, many times in my life. But to find that this is a place that harbors um, uh, different viewpoints, that uh, makes places available for discourse and for narrative, and to bring in people such as Tim Weiss is uh, a, a true honor uh, having been at the University of Houston for many years, I will just say that it's a big place and some, there's almost always something going on there and it's almost always too far to get there. You know, you got to cross 20 parking lots and two time zones and uh, <laughs> some protesters, uh, both on the right and the left. Here, you only got to dodge the left. Uh, not, not, I don't have to guard my right flank all that often. Although I will say that uh, when I sent around a note yesterday about the travel ban, um, I was very gratified to get 25 responses so far. I haven't checked um, because uh, there's some boxes in there that are ticking. I'm having my staff soak them just to make sure that, that uh, they're not bombs. Um, and so far the vote is uh, 23. Way to go, Olivas. Why didn't you speak sooner? You birthright citizen, uh, speak out more. And then two, godless infidel Olivas. Uh, why are you uh, doing what you're doing? And, and I, don't, I don't mind those odds. If, if I could get 23 to 2 votes most of the time, I'd write a lot more. So, uh, so write me more often, and I'll write more. It's that, that's, that's what engagement is. Um, I will say that uh, uh, one of my regrets tonight is I will not be able to hear Tim speak, although I will tell you that although we had never met, we are both met in the sense that I have read his work. I've seen him on YouTube. I have uh, read the parole officer's report, uh, you know, time and time again. When, um, and I will say that uh, he always leaves the place better than he finds it. That's, that's really high praise, I hope he understands. It also turns out that uh, he and I have a, have a love for Brenda Lee, which most of you folks don't know, but when you get a chance, not right now, go Google Brenda Lee. His father-in-law actually used to play in her band and she's the only woman in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and the Country Hall of Fame and uh, she's great. I saw her once. It was one of the great experiences of my life and he gets to see her regularly because he lives in Nashville. I think that's really pretty cool. The last time I was in Nashville I went and saw a Neil Diamond cover band at the hotel where I was staying. Let me just say at about 11 o'clock at night Sweet Caroline doesn't sound nearly as sweet unless, unless Neil's doing it. Uh, I think one of the great things is that uh, you very rarely hear people who acknowledge that they're privileged in our society. There are many people who are, you know, who are born on third base and think they hit a triple, and they just don't know any better than that. Uh, this is a man who goes around, leans into the wind on campuses, uh, fights the good fight, 
uh, moves on to do the same thing the next night, sort of like B.B. King, moving, you know, all those gigs that B.B. had until, until he finally passed. And I will say that you come away with the sense of both the blues, which can sadden you, but they can also enrich you from, from Tim as well. And I think that uh, uh, you're in for a real treat. I truly regret that I have other obligations tonight. I hope I can bag some, some money. Uh, and I want you to know that I'll be vacuuming up the seats here afterwards. So if you've got any loose change, just sort of let it, let it fall out there. Because uh, we, we can always use the money. Thank you all very much. Tim, welcome to UHD. I know that you've left, uh, left us a better uh, school for your having been here. And uh, you folks pay real attention and then engage him, whether or not you agree with him. In fact, he'll be disappointed if you don't disagree with him on some of these points. In that sense, he and I not only share a love of Brenda Lee, but of engagement. So thank you all. Welcome, Tim. We truly appreciate um, Dr. Olivas um, for not only the work that he did here, but uh, his welcome uh, to you, our, our honored guests. Uh, along with Dr. Olivas, we have other members of our executive leadership. I don't know where he is, but our provost and chief academic officer is in the room. That's uh, uh, Mr. Ed Hugetts over there. Give him a round of applause, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Mr. Hugetz is a filmmaker and he's been a staunch supporter of the Center for Critical Race Studies and the incredible work that we attempt to do uh, here at the university and beyond. Well, now I have the illustrious pleasure of introducing you to our, our guest, um, Tim, Mr. Timothy Jacob Wise. He only hears that, of course, when his mom's in the room. <laughs> Was born on October 4th in 1968 <laughs> that's right, that's right, that's right. It's a long and sordid history, people. Uh, and he's among the nation's most uh, prominent anti-racist essayist, educators, and activists. He was born, of course, in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, to Michael and Lucinda Wise. And culturally, Tim grew up in a, uh, a mixed family of uh, Russian, Jewish, and Northern European traditions. And it is at this intersection of these histories that he would, of course, come in contact with the profundity of otherness. At the tender age of uh, 12 years old, and we'll let you think about how long ago that was, Mr. Wise would, of course, experience the attack of uh, synagogue on, um, by white supremacists in the area. This event like his uh, political science and Latin American studies education at Tulane in New Orleans, would serve him well to, uh, in his pursuit to understand and to rectify the structural inequality and oppression that he witnessed around the world. I'd just like to make a footnote at this moment in time that that was white on white violence, and somebody really needs to look into that. Tim Wise has spent the last 25 years of his, uh, of his life working to dismantle the oppressive systems of racism, sexism, homophobia, classism, and ableism. He has fought against the apartheid, um, uh, apartheid in South Africa and as a youth coordinator and associate director of the Louisiana Coalition Against uh, Racism and Nazism, he fought to defeat the political candidacy of the white supremacist and former Ku Klux Klan leader, um, David Duke. He also would go on to serve as a, a policy analyst for a children's advocacy group which focused on combating poverty and economic inequality in the area. Moreover, Mr. Wise has served as an advisor to the Fisk University Race Relations Institute in his beloved hometown of Nashville. As a white ally, my brother Tim Wise has not simply worked locally, but he's also uh, uh, found, he's also lectured and, and hosted workshops in audiences all in all 50 states as well as internationally. He's been to over a thousand college campuses and high school campuses. He's been to hundreds of professional and academic uh, conferences, community groups, corporation meetings, government agencies uh, in order to speak to them about the methods that they need to employ in order to successfully and strategically dismantle 
the racism that plagues our beloved nation. Mr. Wise is the author of seven books, including his highly acclaimed White Like Me, Reflections on Race from a Privileged Son, as well as Dear White America, Letters to a New Minority. Our brother Cornell West, who just visited us not too long ago, would refer to uh, Brother Wise as our vanilla brother in the tradition of uh, the abolitionist John Brown. You see, I too agree uh, with Brother West, for Brother Wise brings uh, an astute and critical lens uh, to the salacious fables of our American meritocracy. Situated inside the privileged white community, Wise offers us a first-hand account of the unacknowledged privileges of white hegemony and the ubiquitous effects of white supremacy. As he would write in his highly acclaimed White Like Me, he would say, hardly any aspect of my life from where I have lived to my education, to my employment history and my friendships has been free from the taint of racial inequality. From, uh, from racism and from whiteness. My, my racial identity has shaped me from the womb for, uh, forward. It had not, if it had not been in control of my own narrative, it, ju it wasn't just race that was a social construct, so was I. It is this ability to illuminate and interrogate the pathology of this social construction that is the signature characteristic of Tim Weiss's work. He brings into full view the systems, the practices, the procedures and policies employed to facilitate an intoxicating dream known as whiteness. And it is in this dreamlike state that whiteness compels all of us as a collective nation uh, to, uh, to escape into a world that does not exist. As ta Coates would say in his beautiful text, um, Between the World and Me, that whiteness asks us to forget. The forgetting, Coates would argue, is a habit, is yet another ne necessary component of the dream and the dreamer. They have forgotten the scale of their theft that enriched them in slavery, the terror that allowed them to, uh, uh, for a century to pillar the, pilfer the vote, the segregationist policies that gave them their suburbs. They have forgotten because to remember would be to tumble them out of that beautiful dream and to force them to live down here with the rest of us, down here in the world. To awaken them is to reveal that they are an empire of humans. And like empires of humans, they are built on the destruction of other people's bodies. It is this that is the stain. It stains their nobility to make them vulnerable, fallible, breakable humans. Like Morpheus in the Matrix, our brother Wise wishes to disrupt our sweet slumber in our white American dream and to call to arms his brothers and sisters of color, his LB, LB, uh, LGBTQ compatriots, and all those who occupy that hyphenated category of oppression. Tim Wise aims to shake us awake tonight to a real and the true appreciation of the beauty and strength that can be found in a color conscious approach to the wonderfully diverse world that we call America. Ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to introduce you to White America's Alarm Clock and our 2017 scholar in residence, Mr. Tim Wise. That was an incredibly comprehensive introduction. Is this actually on? Because I, I don't think I'm getting anything off this. Can you, can you hear me? Because I totally can't hear me. If you at some point cannot, let me know, and I'll try to speak a little more loudly, although I've been here for three days, and my voice is, this is about as good as you're going to get. Um, that was a very comprehensive introduction. I was waiting for the part where you let them know that I uh, like long walks on the beach <laughs> and uh, red wine. 
actually don't like long walks on the beach. I do like red wine. Um, the only thing I really didn't like about that introduction was then you, 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 know, you told them some of the words that I had written in my book, which I used to think, you know, was reasonably well-written stuff, but then you contrasted it with Ta-Nehisi Coates. Don't ever do that to a writer. Why would you do that? Like, here's what this dude said, sort of pedestrian, sort of prosaic, sort of basic, and then here's what this guy said. But we couldn't get him, so we got... <laughs> so we got White America's Alarm Clock. You're welcome, you know. All right. So here's the thing. First of all, thank you so much to everybody at the, uh, at the center. Dr. Robertson, certainly, first and foremost, who made it possible for me to be here for these three days. It's been very rewarding for me. I don't know how other folks feel about it, but it's been really, it's, it's, been, it's been good for me. So I hope you all um, got something out of it that you can use. And if you haven't yet, or if this is the first engagement uh, that you've been privy to, I hope you will this evening. When we booked this, and this has been on the calendar for a minute, this has been something that has been in the works for quite a while, since at least the beginning of the, of the fall semester, right? So, you know, I had a plan. I had a plan. My stuff gets booked out eight, nine, 10, 12 weeks in advance usually. I had a plan. I said, okay, I know what I'm gonna do. I know what my speech is gonna be. I know, cause I, I, sorta, I sorta knew the way the world was gonna go for that three months. Like, I, I had a plan. I even had an outline. I've been trying to do better at that. Lots of times I wait to the last minute, but I sorta, I sorta had my stuff together, right? And then, and I'm gonna use intellectual academic language uh, to explain, some shit happened, <laughs> right? Um, some shit happened, and then I had to like throw away my notes and my outline, and I just had to start over again. So the, the talk I was gonna give um, was assuming a world that is not quite the same world that it was and um, has changed, and so I need to address that. And I need to do it, though, not in a way that ignores the continuity, because there are some certain things that are different today, but there's a lot of things about this struggle for justice and the abolition of white supremacy as a system that is exactly the same as it was six months ago, or six years ago, or 60 years ago. So there's both new and, and old um, that we have to address. It's a very important and a very dangerous time in the history of our country, and I'm glad to have the opportunity both over this three days, but just generally because of the position that I, uh, that I, that I have uh, as a writer and as a speaker and educator to be able to try to offer some clarity about what is happening, why it is happening, and how we might move forward, both with regard to the current political moment, but really this larger moment. Um, and so let me start off, and it sort of goes along with the quote you heard from Coates in the introduction. Um, it was written by the only person who I can say without question is an even finer writer than Coates, and that's James Baldwin. Many years back, James Baldwin said something very similar. He said, people who imagine that history flatters them, as it does, indeed, since they wrote it. See, that's brilliant, right? See, I could just like, I don't even have to finish the damn quote. I could just take the mic out, if it didn't have a cord, drop it right there, and just be like, see, that's it. People who imagine that history flatters them, as it does, indeed, since they wrote it, and then he went on to say, are impaled on their history like a butterfly on a pen, and they become incapable of seeing or changing themselves or the world. This is where it seems to me most white Americans find themselves, Baldwin said, impaled. Right? They are dimly or vividly aware that the history they have fed themselves is mainly a lie, but they do not know how to release themselves from it, and they suffer enormously from the resulting personal incoherence. Right? He said in shorter form in a different part of the same book, these innocent people, and he was using innocent only in the most ironic since these innocent people are trapped in a history they do not understand, and until they understand it, they cannot be released from it. Many years after I read those words, I had the opportunity to be in the audience for an event that uh, Randall Robinson, who was the founder of Trans Africa, one of the seminal anti-apartheid activists and, and uh, human rights activists in this country's history, who finally, uh, at, after many years of the struggle here and throughout the world, moved to St. Kitts and is now an expat, considers himself an expat of the United States, wrote a brilliant book about reparations called The Debt, wrote an even more brilliant book about his decision to leave America called, uh, I think it's Quitting America, it's a book I highly recommend. I was in an audience where Randall Robinson was speaking, he said something very similar in a way to what Baldwin was saying, and 
to what Coates was saying, but it was much shorter form. He said, in effect, he said, if you do not understand what came before, if you do not understand the predicate to everything that you are seeing now, you will not understand those things that you see now. They won't make sense, right? And I think that is perhaps the most profound kind of statement, right? We sometimes disembody our history and we don't really understand why it matters. White folks in particular have a hard time getting our head around why the history of white supremacy and racism matter. Thus, we say things like, why must we talk about this? All this was a long time ago. When are we going to move on? Now, keep in mind the irony of this coming from a people who every July 4th go and set off fireworks to some shit that happened a really long time ago. Because we did not break away from the British last Wednesday. That is some old stuff. But every damn year, we're wearing red, white, and blue, eating apple pie and hot dogs, setting off fireworks to remind you of the really good stuff that happened a long time ago that we definitely do not want to let go of. So there's a certain irony and a certain hypocrisy, right, in saying that black and brown folks need to get over the past when we clearly haven't done it. We love the past as long as it's a past that makes us feel good. So that's point number one, but we can sort of shelve that because that's obvious. Right? But I think it's even more interesting right now in this political moment to point out the relationship of the past to the present. Because if you don't learn anything else about this presidential election, know this. The only reason that Donald Trump is in the White House right now, the only reason that he is in the White House right now is because of a thing called the Electoral College, which was created for a very particular purpose and not the one folks are telling you. Not the one they're telling you. Putting aside the ideological reasons that he won, he lost the popular vote by three million votes. No, they were not quote unquote illegal votes. That is a lie for which there's no evidence. He lost, but he wins the popular, loses the popular vote, wins the electoral college. What is the electoral college? It is a system that was set up at the founding for very specific reasons. They tell you now it was to prevent tyranny. A, that wasn't the purpose, right? And B, if that was the purpose, okay, that shit failed, right? So. So we might want to do a rethink because clearly it is not fulfilling its intended purpose. But really, that wasn't its purpose. You think the founders were against tyranny? Well, they were against a certain kind of tyranny. They were quite comfortable with another kind of tyranny. They were certainly comfortable with the tyranny of enslavement. They were comfortable with the tyranny of the genocide of indigenous peoples. Later, their descendants would be quite comfortable with the tyranny of the theft of half of Mexico and the war of aggression that this nation started on false pretense. They were certainly comfortable, their descendants, with the tyranny of using Chinese labor forced to work on the railroads to build the transcontinental economy. So. Let's be very clear, that could not have been the purpose, regardless of what they tell you. Here is the purpose. Why it happened was because you had a handful of states like, first and foremost, Virginia, right? That at the founding, at the Constitutional Convention was concerned, if we have direct elections for the presidency, right, which based on population within the state, right, we're gonna have trouble, aren't we, in Virginia? Because see, about 40% of our population doesn't get to vote. And the reason 40% of our population isn't considered eligible to even vote or considered as people is because we got this three-fifths compromise that says they're not real people. We don't want to treat them like people. We don't want to count them as full people. We do want to count them as three-fifths so we get that census number up a little bit because that helps us. But we don't want them to be full people. So if we have 40% of our population that's discounted by two-fifths, right? Then if you have direct elections for the presidency, states like us are going to be harmed by that. The only way you balance that power is to create this artificial system of the electoral college. So make no mistake, in large part, the electoral college exists as a giveaway to white supremacy, as a way to say to slave owners, all right, all right, all right, here's your little, you know, here's the bone we're going to throw you which is to say that even if you don't think that Donald Trump was elected because of racism in 2017, make no mistake, he was elected because of racism in 1787. We know that, right? That's very clear. So the past affects the present, right? And it isn't just people of color who want to get that. Now, there's an awful lot of white folks, not the majority, sadly, but an awful lot of white folks not happy with the outcome of the election. Well, there's the evidence that the past affects the present. So now white folks are learning what black folks already knew. Welcome to the country in which we live. Glad to see you. But this is stuff that you have to, you know, if you don't understand the predicate, going back to what Randall Robinson said, 
or if you imagine that history flatters you and you don't have to actually know the truth about it, then nothing that you see makes sense. If you don't know that the history of modern policing traces to slave patrols, if you don't understand the historic mistreatment of black and brown bodies by law enforcement, they are the ones who enforce the black codes, they are the ones who enforce segregation, they are the ones who pull black bodies and the bodies of white and other non-black allies off the stools in the sit-ins, they are the ones who turn water cannons on children in Birmingham, they are the ones who beat the hell out of folks on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, they are the ones who have enforced the war on drugs, they are the ones who were involved in the Rampart scandal in the Los Angeles Police Department, which was about cops planting evidence on suspects for crimes they had not committed. Black and brown peoples know this history. Mexican-American folks, particularly in places like Los Angeles, know the history of the Zoot Suit riots in 1943, where you had cops and military officers, soldiers, rampaging through Mexican-American communities just because they could. See, black and brown bodies know that history. But if you don't know that history, which white America, by and large, has had the luxury of not knowing, and not just the luxury, one might say the privilege of not knowing, then you can't understand a movement like Black Lives Matter it doesn't make sense. What do you mean? You know, why? Why do you need this? Why do black men run from the cops? Okay, for real? That's your question? Right? You can only ask that question if you don't know history. It is irrational for most white folks to run from cops because for most white folks, and not, not all, I realize, right? But for white America writ large, police are the folks that come get your cat out the tree right, or come and give your little Joey a ride around in the police car to let him know how gosh darn exciting it is to be an officer of the law, right, but that's not been the black and brown experience by and large. This is not, by the way, and let us be clear, meant as an attack on officers as officers. I'm talking about a culture of law enforcement. I'm talking about a culture of policing. If you learn nothing else about racism tonight, know this. It's not about good people and bad people. It's not about good white folks and bad white folks, good cops and bad cops. It's about a culture and a system, a set of institutional practices that perpetuate inequality. The culture of policing does that and has always done that. The culture of policing is the culture that punishes any cop who steps out of line and turns in his partner or somebody else in the department for wrongdoing. Right? If you have a culture that if you rat out somebody for violating the Constitution, God forbid you would do that, you'll be the one whose career is ended, right? That's a cultural problem within the body of law enforcement, and again, it's something about which people of color know, right? And therefore, Black Lives Matter makes perfect sense. You have to articulate that which has been ignored. You have to demand that which has been left out. You have to specify that which has been overlooked. Right? That's why the reply of all lives matter makes no sense. In addition to being offensive, we don't have to say all. We know all lives matter. My girls are 13 and 15. They're white. I know their lives matter. I don't need to be told that by somebody on Twitter. Right? But the deal is the cops also know their lives matter. And the employers know their lives matter. And their teachers know that their lives matter. And the bank loan officers know that their lives matter. That's the problem. They don't know the same thing about black people. Right? So we have to specify that which has been left out. Just like we need to have Black History Month, don't need White History Month, because we got May, June, July, August, September, every other damn month. Right? To say all lives matter is like going back to 1970 when the statement, the big statement was black is beautiful. Right? You have black folks reclaiming beauty standards, saying beauty is not just white and blonde right? and, 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 and blue eyes. Right? Black is beautiful, claiming a black aesthetic as beautiful, to say all lives matter be like getting in a time machine, going back to 1970, hearing somebody say black is beautiful and responding, well, we're all beautiful in our own way. Yes, yeah, shut up, we know. <laughs> Doesn't need to be said. Don't need to say it. We got you. We understand that, right? But again, if you don't know the predicate, Right? Black Lives Matter seems exclusionary and separatist. When Randall Robinson made that statement that I mentioned, he was given a talk about affirmative action, right? Which affirmative action doesn't make sense if you don't understand the history and the contemporary reality of racial discrimination, right? If you don't know about that, if you're not clear about it, it does seem like just something that people made up to give preference to these folks. If you understand the history and the ongoing reality of racism, then it fits together like a like a jigsaw puzzle, you realize all affirmative action, for instance, as weak as that is, is trying to do, is rectify that some folks had a three-lap head start and an eight-lap race. And the fact that they crossed the finish line first does not, in fact, mean they are faster runners. That means they had a three-lap head start in an eight-lap race, and if you have that, your ass is supposed to cross the line first. 
and if you had an advantage in terms of job opportunity, your resume ought to look better. That's how that works. It doesn't mean you're actually more qualified. So he was trying to say that, because if you don't know what came before, nothing else will make sense. I think about this not as an activist, not as an educator, as a scholar, as a writer. Think about it as a dad, right? Because when you're a parent and you see your kids starting to begin to understand the world or ask questions about the world, it's a beautiful thing. It's an amazing thing, right? Because you get to sort of help them discover stuff that, you know, you don't remember when you discovered it, and now you get to see them do it. It's pretty, pretty amazing, right? So one day... Um, I was driving, our daughters are both dancers, um, and at the time they were both dancing in a studio, they were in a company downtown, we're driving to the dance studio from their school to the downtown in Nashville, it's about an eight minute drive on surface streets, eight, nine minutes. And in order to get from the school to the studio, we had to go through a public housing community. We've been driving this route every day for a year, every day of the week for a year, going the same way, coming through public housing. And we get to a red light in the middle of this community where you got public housing on this side, you got public housing on this side, and we're sitting there at the red light for a minute, and my girls at that time were 10 and 12, or as the kids like to say, 10 and a half and 12 and a half, <laughs> right? Because uh, they like to give themselves that extra six months, you know? It's like, sometimes I'll say I'm five, eight and a half, but really, I'm five, eight, <laughs> you know? Same thing. Um, but, uh, so we're stopped at the red light, and, you know, like I said, we've been making this drive every day, but the youngest daughter, the 10-year-old, uh, that particular day, looks around and she says, uh, Daddy, why is it that pretty much everybody in this neighborhood is black? That's a damn good question. That is a very good urban anthropological question, sociological question, right? She is observing the reality around her and she's doing what a sociologist does. She's doing what an anthropologist does. She's doing what a scholar does and she's 10 years old. She's saying, why is this like this? Now, Here's what's deep. Well, first of all, before I get into it, um, here's something I didn't know, because I was an only child. Um, I did not know that when you have a sibling, and the older sibling is in the presence of the younger sibling, when the younger sibling asks a question of the parent, I did not know that the older sibling will invariably offer his or her answer to the question as a way to show out and to demonstrate their superior knowledge relative to their younger sibling. I did not know this. I learned this on that day. And so the 12-year-old, remember what the 10-year-old question was? She said, why is pretty much everybody in this neighborhood black? And just as I'm getting ready to answer the question, because we only had about four minutes till we're at the studio, I wasn't going to give her the PhD version, but I was ready because I know my stuff because this is, this is my job, so I'm good. I'm like, that's the question to ask me. Don't ask me how to do the taxes. Don't ask me how to do a quadratic equation or even what a quadratic equation is. Do not ask me any of that. Don't ask me about the periodic table of the elements, the chart, whatever it is. I don't know. Ask me about that. She asked me, I'm ready, and then the 12-year-old jumps in with her answer, redlining, which is scary-ass accurate, as a matter of fact, <laughs> if you know the history of housing discrimination in America. I was like, what the hell was that? <laughs> like, you know, some of this might be biologically transmitted. I mean, it's certain cell, there's some cell memory, because I don't think I mumble that in my sleep. I don't think that my kids ever heard me talk about it. I looked at her, and then her sister looked at her and said, yeah, I don't know what that is. I said, I don't think your sister does either. I think she's showing off, but she was right. And then the 12-year-old was like, yeah, I don't really know, but uh, I know something about it, but why don't you explain it? I'm like, okay, I will. <laughs> so for those who don't know the history, this is really important. Um, her answer, though not entirely comprehensive, is a big piece of it, right? The history of black urban space is a history of marginality and discrimination and exclusion. So let's keep in mind, first of all, a couple things we might not realize. Public housing in America was created for white people. Let's be very clear about that. It was created for poor white people. Every so-called welfare program in America was in fact created for white people, and black and brown folks were almost entirely excluded from all of them for the first 20 years. Right? And public housing for the first several years, at least for the first seven, eight to ten years, was almost exclusively white. But then what the government did is they started creating other programs for white housing opportunity, FHA loans, VA loans, later the GI Bill. It allowed white folks who had been living in the urban core, working class and low income, to hustle it out to the suburbs where only we were allowed to live because black and brown folks were barred from living there, leaving behind black and brown folks in the cities, which wouldn't have necessarily been a big deal if they had had access to capital so that they could own their own businesses, build their own homes, have their own functioning community, but then that's where redlining comes in. So you had banks, lending institutions, right, that would take big maps on the wall and literally take a red marker and the boundaries of the black community would be entirely, 
you know, in this red line. You would draw a red line around the entire community. Anybody who lived in that line, within the borders of that box, right, um, was not going to get a loan. You weren't going to get a mortgage loan for a home. You weren't going to get a business startup loan. If you already had a home, you weren't going to get an equity loan to add on to the house or to make improvements or whatever it was. And as a result, it wasn't just that segregation was reinforced, white folks able to hustle it out here, black and brown folks locked in, but it was also that those spaces deteriorated in terms of economic quality and infrastructure. So it's not just that that's why it's black, that's why it's poor, right? That's why it looks the way that it looks, right? And I give her that brief little, you know, three to four minute thing, and then we're at the studio and we're done, and I've done my good deed for the day. Um, but understand why I'm telling you this story. It's not to show off my, I mean, I'm supposed to know that. This is my job. But think about what happens when a child sees the same phenomena, because my daughter's not any more perceptive than any other 10-year-old. I'm sure the black children who live in that neighborhood want to know. And I'm sure that other white children who pass through that neighborhood want to know. But do they ask? And if they do ask, do their parents know the answer? Because what if you don't know the answer? Right? What happens if the child, what, what happens if my daughter, if Rachel, wants to know the answer to that question, but either she's too shy to ask it because, you know, we're not supposed to talk about race. We're not even supposed to notice difference. My goodness, if you notice difference, that's what makes you a racist is what we're told. So what if she doesn't even ask the question or she asks it, and I'm probably like most white American parents, and maybe even some parents of color, I'm like, I don't know. I may have some vague idea that discrimination is involved, but that's sort of a weak answer, right? If I don't give her the answer, what do you think she does? Do you think she stops wondering? No. She's going to keep wondering, but you know the only answer she's going to be able to come to, right, is the one that the culture implicitly gives her every day. And what's that? What's the one thing that we were all taught? If you were born and reared in this country, even if you immigrated here and have been here more than a minute, what's the one thing, regardless of race, regardless of class, regardless of nationality, ethnicity, language of origin, religion, geographic location, sexual orientation, physical ability or disability, sex or gender, that we have all been taught? It is this. It is the secular gospel of America. It is our creation myth. It is the notion that wherever you end up is all about you, rugged individualism, the notion of meritocracy. If you work hard, you can make it. If you didn't make it, it's because you didn't work hard enough. Now, if I am taught that, and I am indeed taught that, as every one of you in this room were, if I am taught that, and then I look around, and I see that neighborhood, and I see the condition of that neighborhood. And then I look where the white folks mostly live, and I see the condition of that neighborhood. What is the logical conclusion that I reach? See, now it's not even irrational to conclude with a racist thought. It's highly rational, in fact. It makes perfect sense if I put the objective reality of what sociologists call stratification together with the subjective reality of the propaganda that I was taught. Racism becomes the default position. Classism becomes the default position. Right, because rich up here, poor down here, must be because they're smarter. White up here, black and brown down here, must be because they work harder. It also reinforces sexism and patriarchy. Men disproportionately up here in the power structure, women down here, must be because women don't want it as bad, they don't work as hard. Right? So in other words, the default position of our silence and our lack of an understanding of history is to reinforce the very inequalities that history then presents to us in current day form in real time. Right? So if we're really going to fight this thing called white supremacy, if we're really going to fight this thing called the class system, if we're going to fight patriarchy and misogyny, we have to interrogate and absolutely deconstruct the founding myth of the country. That's hard stuff. That's like standing up in the second pew of a church and announcing that there is no God. So you better strap in for that fight because that's not going to be an easy fight. But that's the fight because as long as I'm being told this thing about rugged individualism, Right? And which, by the way, like as a side note, you do realize, don't you, that there is no such thing as a rugged individual. That's a complete lie. It's a contrivance, an American conceit. There's no such thing as a rugged, hell, there's no such thing as an individual abstracted from their social context. Human beings are social creatures. None of us were raised on an island by a porpoise. <laughs> right? We had people, we had family, we had community, we had tribe, we had nation, we had communities and cultures. None of us were raised in isolation. If you ever do meet something that qualifies as a rugged individual, take my word for it. You need to run like hell away from that thing. Because that thing will be feral and dangerous. It will not have language. It will not know that it is not supposed to eat you because nobody told them about the taboo against eating other people because it will not even know it is a person, right? There's no rugged individual. We're social creatures. We live in social context. 
So we've all had help is what I'm trying to say. Those who were up here, even when they are folks of color, had some help along the way. Had somebody who came along and believed in them, had a mentor, had a teacher, had a particular kind of parent. Those who were down here, right, even when they're struggling, we all have helped to get wherever it is we've gotten. None of us have gotten or failed to get totally on our own. We're victims of circumstance and luck and a lot of other things over which we have no control. And that's scary for us to admit, right, because we want to be the captains of our own ship. We want to believe that if we just double down on the work effort, everything will be fine. And yet we all know people who've worked hard every day and got nothing. Or like the president said at the outset, stealing my line, biting my bars, but I'm going to go ahead and say it anyway, right? That there's some folks who were born on third and think they hit a triple, right? And we know people like this. What? There are people who got to take over their daddy's real estate empire that was worth $237 million in the late 1970s and made billions of dollars and are convincing people all around the country that uh, they're actually self-made men. So that stuff happens. If you're not clear on who I'm speaking of, you might want to Google that later, um, right? So we're so bought into the myth, we want to believe it. We want to believe it, even though we know at some level that it isn't true. Well, why is it dangerous? Why is it dangerous to not understand that past with regard to the things that we see, the inequalities that we see? Well, I've already sort of said one thing, right? It reinforces racism, classism, sexism, reinforces all these narratives and thus systems of inequality. Let me tell you what else it can do, right? What does it do to the person on the bottom? What does it do to the community that's being marginalized? What, you think that those folks haven't been taught the same thing? They've been taught that wherever they end up is all about them, right? So some folks in that community may come to internalize their oppression, may come to internalize their self-doubt, wonder why it is that they and their people can't, quote unquote, get their shit together, right? And you'll hear that from marginalized communities. Why can't we get our stuff together? What's wrong with us, right? That's an internalization of oppression that comes from not knowing the systemic barriers. The system was not set up for you, right? If the system wasn't created for you, why would you be shocked that it doesn't deliver, right? After Katrina, a lot of folks, including Spike Lee, for whom I have great respect, both as a filmmaker and a social commentator, but Spike Lee said after Katrina, and I lived in New Orleans for 10 years, so it was really personal to me. I know people that were displaced. I know folks who died. I know folks who haven't been able to get back to their homes. Because I spent 15 months working in public housing, and public housing was virtually destroyed after Katrina. Displaced, right? Residents knocked out of their homes. Some of them came here, and some folks have never gotten back, right? City's fundamentally different than it was. After that happened, Spike Lee said that what happened in Katrina was a system failure of monumental proportions. But nah, it wasn't, right? Most of the stuff he says I agree with, but that wasn't a system failure. The only way that you can believe that what happened to the poor and black folks of New Orleans was a system failure is if you believe that the system was set up to serve those folks. And if you believe that that system was set up to serve those folks, you've never been in New Orleans. And you don't know black folks very well, and you've never been in black communities, certainly not that one, because they know the system wasn't set up for them. If a system is not set up to serve you, and then it proceeds not to serve you, logic says that's not a system failure, that is system success. That is the system working exactly as it was programmed, right? So we have to think differently, and we have to understand the past for that reason as well. We also need to understand it because if my daughter doesn't know what came before the stuff she sees, she'll internalize her own sense of superiority. Oh, well, these people must not be as smart as we are because they live over here in conditions that look like this. But then think about what else might be dangerous. What happens to white folks who were told this rugged individualism thing and for generation after generation after generation, right, it works for most of us. Now, there are always those white folks who fall through the cracks, right, who have suffered and have struggled economically and because of other identity markers. But for the most part, white America's had the luxury historically of believing that that myth is not really a myth, that it's more or less true. The next generation will be better off than I was. I was better off than my parents, right? There was an old saying in working class white communities, as long as you're strong and can lift stuff, you got a strong back and can lift things, you'll always have a job, right? And so, in other words, you internalize this idea, all right then, all I got to do is work hard, all I got to do is play by the rules, all I got to do is everything right, right, and not make too many mistakes and I'll make it. See, here's the thing, most black and brown folks do know to question that. Most black and brown folks know to question that, but a lot of white folks don't. Now what happens, see? If you tell me that my life is supposed to be a 7, 8, 9, or 10 as long as I bust ass and work real hard, and I've had the luxury of believing that because for the most part, people like me do that, it works out for them. And then all of a sudden, the economy shifts beneath my feet because of globalization, because of the shutting down and manufacturing jobs, which I beg to remind you, began in 1973, not under the presidency of Barack Obama. That's not new stuff. That's been happening since I was five, 
right? And if all of a sudden those jobs flee and your coal town is dying, and the coal town is not, by the way, dying because of environmentalists and hippies who are not allowing you to mine coal, right? The coal town is dying because the coal companies have figured out that it is cheaper to get the coal out of the mountain by blowing the top off the mountain than actually hiring people to go down and get it, right? So it's a labor-saving device by rich white men having nothing to do with brown folks or poor folks or people of color or welfare or any of that stuff, right? But if my coal town is dying and my manufacturing plants are leaving and my, all the shops on Main Street are, bo are boarded up and you told me wherever I end up is all about me, Oh, hell, what do I do with that, right? How do I make sense of my struggle when you told me if I'm struggling, there is something wrong with me? That's what you told me. As long as I'm not struggling, everything's fine, right? Right, 364 days out of the year, everything's cool, but if the layoff, the pink slip comes on day 365, now I got a problem. It's a psychological problem. How do I make sense of it? What do I do with it? You told me where I am is about my own effort. So if I'm struggling, if I'm out of work for 26 weeks when the recession hits, right? some folks 52 weeks, millions of white folks struggling in that recession. Now I should point out people of color actually got hit worse. Like black folks' wealth was overwhelmingly wiped out. 60, 70, 75% of African-American wealth and assets wiped out in the recession. That was far harder hit than white folks, but that's not to diminish white pain. There were millions of white folks that did go belly up on their homes. Millions of white folks that couldn't afford health care anymore. Millions of white folks that couldn't afford their kids' college education. So I feel for that, even though black and brown suffering might have been worse in a quantitative way, all suffering is pretty shitty and needs to be taken seriously, right? So it's not really about who's hurting more. It's about a system that produces pain for an awful lot of people, regardless of color, regardless of culture, regardless of ethnicity. But what's interesting is if you've told me that that isn't going to happen to me, as long as I work hard and then I find that it is happening to me, now I have a sort of a dilemma. I have to either internalize the shame for my situation, because remember, the myth of meritocracy says wherever I end up is on me. So now I have to either blame myself, maybe even come to hate myself, doubt myself, think that maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe I'm just not smart enough. Maybe I'm not good enough. I now have a shame, and people don't operate well when they're operating from shame. Right? So I have to either internalize the shame and the blame, but that'll eat me alive. So what do I do instead? Well, if a politician comes along and tells me, oh, it's not you, baby. Uh -uh. It's those people over there. It's those brown people coming across that border who are taking your job. Side note, beg to remind you, um, when folks say that Mexican folks are taking their job, my, I always ask them, well, did you have the job yet? Right? <laughs> Because unless you already had the job, that shit was not yours, right? <laughs> like, like, you know, I mean, I guess if, like, bosses were firing white folks left and right and replacing them with Mexican-American folk, maybe you'd have an argument. But if you didn't have the job yet, that shit was not yours. That was not your job to have. Plus, I always find it interesting when folks say that black and brown folks are taking all their jobs and that black and brown folks are lazy and don't want to work, because it cannot be both. <laughs> Right? Like, if, you, if you're taking all the jobs, you're like the opposite of whatever lazy is. And if you are actually lazy, you're not even taking one job, let alone all the damn jobs. So I don't ask much of racists because I expect so damn little, but the one thing that I do ask for is some consistency. I do not appreciate moving target bias. I just want you to pick one stupid ass stereotype and stick with it so I don't have to shoot at both of them. That's all I ask. That's all I ask. So. So here's the thing, I either have to internalize the shame and think there's something wrong with me or I gotta find a scapegoat. Into that breach walks a politician who says it's those people or if it's not them, it's those Muslim folks making you afraid of terrorism, so we're gonna make you, I'll keep you safe, that's another thing you're afraid of. Or, or it's those black folks over there protesting police brutality, or those black folks who I can now stereotype as all pathological, dysfunctional, none of them have jobs, none of them have an education, they can't walk out the door without getting shot. Right, that was Trump's thing. Black people can't walk out the door without getting shot. Well, maybe that was his reason why there were no black people in his audience when he said that. Because they were like, they're too afraid. No, it's because you went to a white suburb to give that speech because you weren't actually trying to show compassion for black people. You were virtue signaling to white people. You were telling white people, don't forget how pathological they are. Don't forget how dysfunctional and messed up they are. Don't forget how horribly criminal and evil they are. Just remember that. But I'm going to couch it in compassion. So if I say to these people who are hurting, they are your problem, 
then that relieves me. I can now project. This is just psych 101. I can project my own feelings of inadequacy onto some other source. This is what the ancients did when they used to sacrifice goats to stop plagues. That's where the term scapegoat comes from, right? This idea, you got a plague or an illness in your community, and so you take a, a, a sacrificial lamb or a goat of some type, and you kill it on an altar to God, thinking that that's going to solve the plague. Now, it never solved the plague. Never got rid of what, they didn't, it didn't have rain on Monday, they killed the goat Tuesday, it still didn't have rain on Wednesday, right? But they kept doing it, thinking that if they just, maybe if the goat was fatter, Right? Maybe if the lamb was larger or cuter or something or meant more to its previous owner, like that would somehow solve the problem. And just like those scapegoats of old, these don't actually solve the problem, but they momentarily block the pain receptors, which brings me to an interesting point. There was one particular factor that most highly correlated with support for Donald Trump right? in terms of communities. You know what that was? It wasn't economic anxiety. That's what folks said, right, economic anxiety, but you know, can't really be that, right, because if economic anxiety is what made you vote for Trump, black and brown folks would have lined up around the damn block to vote for Donald Trump, right? Black folks are twice as likely as white folks to be unemployed, even when they have a college degree, so there's a little anxiety there. Latino and Latina folks, right, twice, well, 50% more likely uh, to be unemployed than white folks, even when they have a college degree. Asian American and Pacific Islander folks, 23% according to the Labor Department, more likely to be unemployed than white folks, even when they have a college degree. Some Southeast Asian communities, those rates are two to one uh, in certain areas. Houston being one of those areas, by the way, where Southeast Asian communities are considerably below the well-being of white folks. And it's important to point that out because we always hear Asian American and Pacific Islanders referred to as these model minorities who are all doing well. That isn't true for Vietnamese folk. It's not true for Hmong folk, Lao folk, Thai folk, Cambodian folk, both in Houston and around the country as a whole. Um, so if economic anxiety were enough, people of color would have been in the forefront of the Trump movement, right? But they were not. So clearly it wasn't just about that. You know what one of the, if not the most highly correlated factor, was the degree of addiction to opiates. Y'all have heard about this opioid crisis in white America, right? Right? White folks starting off with oxy or whatever, over-the-counter opioids, and then moving on to street heroin because it gets in your system faster, and frankly, it's sometimes easier to get than an illegal script. Right? Now, you might think, well, what does it have to do with Trump? Well, think about this for a minute. And I'm not trying to make like some crass joke about, you know, you've got to be a drug addict to vote for Donald Trump. I'm not saying that. Like, it's, it's not about that. It's not like, oh, you're high. That's why you did it. No, that's not, that's not my point. Um, that joke is too easy. No, this, this is not... This is not a joke at all. This is dead, deadly serious. What does an opioid do? You know, pharmacologically, what is an opioid? Right? An opiate, right? An opiate or an opioid is something that is designed to block pain receptors, right? Um, so morphine does that when you are a cancer patient and you're in great pain or any other kind of injury, great pain, they'll give you morphine. Now, morphine doesn't solve the cancer. It doesn't get rid of whatever's happened if you've, you know, broken a, a vertebra or something and they've got you on a drip, right? Same thing with, with oxy, same thing with heroin that you inject in your veins. It doesn't solve whatever your problem is, but it blocks the pain reception, right? So in a sense, we need to think of, particularly given the correlation between real pharmacological opioid addiction and Trump support, we need to think of Donald Trump as a walking, talking, human, breathing opioid, right? Because this is somebody who walks into your life and says, I can take away your pain. I can block your pain, right? I can solve the problem, just like any, any you know, heroin addict. It's funny, right? We, it's interesting, isn't it, the terminology we don't use for white folks when they get hooked on stuff. Because in the 70s, when there was an opioid crisis in black America, in urban America, Latino America, right, uh, around street heroin, we just call folks junkies. Right? And we didn't talk about education, we didn't talk about treatment, we didn't talk about rehab, we didn't talk about compassion, just like with the crack epidemic in the 80s, we didn't talk about that, we just locked folks up. Now all of a sudden we got folks coming out the woodwork to say, oh, we have to have compassion for these people. And of course that's true. Um, but it's just interesting, right, that you got the same people that are turning to le le you know, legit pharmacological opioids are in the same communities where folks are maybe not doing that, but they're turning to a political opioid in the form of Dave Donald Trump who says, I can solve your problem. But just like those actual opiates, it only numbs the pain. It doesn't really solve the pain. What we're seeing with Donald Trump is, on the one hand, new because of his sort of malignant narcissism, his, his, his own personality issues, which are somewhat unique. I mean, every politician has ego, right? Um, you have to, to think that you're qualified to 
run the country or to be the most powerful, arguably, most powerful person in the world. But this isn't just normal ego, right? This is, this is like, again, Psych 101. This is pretty clinical narcissism. So there's a danger in that, right? Somebody who simply can't apologize for anything, can't ever admit that they're wrong, has these grandiose notions of his own popularity and feels the need to repeat over and over again how popular he is, even when the evidence suggests that might not be true, right? Uh, or is just not true at all, um, you know? And, and so there's a real new danger to that. But some of this isn't new at all. And again, this goes back to if you don't know the past, you won't understand the present. See, what we just watched happen, keep in mind how many white folks in particular were blown away by the fact that Donald Trump won. And the reason I say so many white folks is not that many folks of color were shocked. Now, folks of color might be surprised because folks of color reading the same polls, right, and thinking, okay, I, I don't think he's going to win. But most folks of color, there's a difference between being surprised and being shocked. To be surprised about the outcome is because you're reading the same tea leaves everybody else is. To be shocked is to act like white America would never do anything like this. <laughs> and to believe that white America would never do anything like this is to have never, ever met white people or studied the history of whiteness in this country. Right? Because it isn't, if you saw the SNL skit the week after the election, right? Chris Rock and Dave Chappelle were on SNL. It was a brilliant skit. It wasn't just funny because of who was in it. It was brilliantly conceived, right? These white folks in Brooklyn hanging out in their flat in their gentrified Brooklyn neighborhood, right? All say, oh, Hillary's got this. It's going to be a great night. And, you know, Dave Chappelle's like, well, it's going to be a long night, you know? And, and then Chris Rock comes over and the white folks are stunned that Donald Trump is winning. It's the most racist thing that's ever happened in America. And, and Chappelle and Rock are like, really? The most racist? racist thing that's ever happened, you know, people of color, not necessarily shocked because people of color, particularly with regard to race, have a, a deeper, I think, appreciation of the history. So this is why we need to understand what just happened. This is a repetition of a 400 year narrative. It is the culmination of a 400 plus year process that ought not shock anybody. What am I talking about? Well, back in the 1600s, this begins and it continues to the present. If you really wanted to understand the history of America with regard to race and class and encapsulate it in one sentence, here is the sentence. The whole history of America is the history of rich white men telling not rich white people that their problems are black and brown people, period. That is, that is all you need to, all the rest is commentary as the scripture says, right? That's all you need to know, that the history of America is the history of rich white men telling not rich white people that their problems are black and brown people. What do I mean? Let's start in the 1600s. Right? Keep in mind, this is at a time before whiteness is a thing. There is no such thing as the white race yet. Right? These white nationalists who are coming out of the woodwork in this election would like you to believe that the white race has this long and glorious history. It doesn't even have a 500-year history. The white race as a concept has only been around since the middle of the 1600s. That's not what Europeans called ourselves in Europe. We didn't think of ourselves as one big happy family. Are you kidding? Europeans on the same team? We spent most of our time killing each other. That was the history of Europe, was the history of killing each other and trying to figure out who the witch was. <laughs> I mean, that's basically the history of Europe. You're the witch. Well, you're a witch. No, you're a warlock. Well, <laughs> damn it, right? <laughs> I'm only exaggerating a little bit. I learned that in AP European history. That's, that's the European history for smart people, right? Um, so... We weren't one big happy family. We get here, and look, the, the, the English hated the Irish. The Irish hated them right back. Northern Italians didn't even think Southern Italians were Italians, right? Seriously, they, they thought they were Mediterranean or North African peoples. There wasn't even Italian unity, right, let alone European unity. The Germans hated everybody, and everybody hated them right back, right? So there was no unity of purpose, right? But in the colonies of what would become the United States, there became a need for a new team, because the landowners looked around, right, and realized, wow, we are really outnumbered. We didn't really think the math through on this shit. Like, we, we brought over these indentured European peoples who were peasants, just one level above enslaved themselves, worked seven or 11 years until they can work off their indenture, at which point we'll then give them 50 acres of land and the tools to work the land. So it was definitely a better deal than enslavement. But it was still pretty crappy for the people who were in it, right? And we got all these Africans who we have enslaved, and they outnumber us. You put these peasant Europeans together with these African folks, and we're like outnumbered two to one, three to one, some communities 10 to one, places like South Carolina. Man, like half the population or more was enslaved. You add the poor European peasants to that, mm, you're seriously out numbered so if you're a landowner right you got to think to yourself we have got to come up with something 
right? Because if we don't figure out a way to split these coalitions, because every now and then these folks would get it together, right? These peasant Europeans and these African enslaved folks would figure out the game, figure out the hustle, join together to have a rebellion, Bacon's Rebellion being one, but not the only example in 1676, 100 years before the Declaration of Independence. And so after these rebellions start to happen, the landowners in places like Virginia start to pass all these new laws. And these laws are encoded as applying to members of the white race, any white, per, any person of Europe. Now, no matter how lowly, right, was going to be placed above any African descended person. And there were going to be very clear markers of privilege and advantage. So you'd be able to own land, not much, but a little parcel of land, if you were male at least, because obviously this was still a, a patriarchal setup, right? Um, you'd be able to enter into contracts, testify in court. Right? We'd get rid of indentured servitude by the early 1700s, just get rid of it altogether. So you don't have to worry about that anymore. Right? You'll never be unfree labor again. Right? And very importantly, they started putting all these poor European, uh, particularly men, on the slave patrols. Right? Actually saying, not, not even offering it, like requiring it. If you were a male in a slaveholding area and you were poor, you would be the one who'd be given a horse and a badge and a gun, and you got to keep black people in line. See, now I'm making you think you're on my team, right? I'm actually giving you a little bit of power, not a whole lot of power, not going to give you any money or, or any significant amount of land, right? You're not going to have enough to actually have power, but I'm going to make you feel like you're on the posse, you're part of the team. You might be at the end of the bench, but you're wearing the uniform, right? And we're calling you the white race, and now you're part of us. And all of a sudden, these rebellions diminish, right? Because they were dividing and conquering these class-based coalitions because of this new category called whiteness. And it worked, right? Fast forward, it continued to work. It works at the time of the, and there are many examples I could use before this, but I'll skip ahead to the Civil War era, right? Where you have elite landowners in the South announcing publicly, as they certainly did here in Texas, that the reason for breaking away from the Union was inarguably and exclusively for the purpose of maintaining the ownership of other human beings in a system of chattel slavery and for the maintenance of white supremacy. Alexander Stevens, vice president of the Confederacy, says famously that the great truth, the cornerstone of this new government is the great truth that the Negro is not the equal to the white man. The state of Texas makes it very clear as they leave the Union that that is the purpose, is to maintain white supremacy in the system, the glorious system of Negro slavery, as they called it, uh, in the Secession Declaration, both here and in the state of Mississippi, as well as other places. Right? So they were very clear about it, but now here's the trick. The rich who owned other people didn't want to go to war. Right? They weren't going to go to war. Rich people never go to war. That's the point. Rich people don't go to war. They get poor people to go to war for them. Rich people don't go to war. They get doctors to write them phony-ass notes when Vietnam is happening saying that they have heel spurs and cannot fight. Once again, Google it. Right? Rich people get poor people to do their dirty work for them. So the rich had no intention of fighting. But how do you get the poor to go fight to maintain slavery? That's hard, right? Because these are my slaves. I'm the one who owns them, right? You don't own anything. You barely own the, the shirt on your back. So why the hell would you go fight for my stuff, right? That, that's a weird thing. Well, the only reason that you would do it is because I convince you that, oh, it's in your interest. How do I do that? I say, look, if these folks get free, they're going to take your job. No, fool, they have your job. That's the point. If you charge a dollar a day to work on that farm or in that blacksmith shop or in the house or building the levees or whatever they were having enslaved people do, if you got to charge a dollar a day as a white man to do that job or as a white woman to do that job, but I can get the one who I own to do it for free precisely because I own them, guess who gets the job? Free gets the job. Because people like free. If they don't have to pay for labor, they will do that. Right? So in a sense, the system of white supremacy, at least in basic economic sense, undercut the wage base of working class white people. In the long run, working class white people would have been at least economically better off to fight for a different system in solidarity with those who were enslaved. But they were sold this notion, this divide and conquer, if they get free, they're going to hurt you. And remember, you're on our team. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 I almost forgot. And then hundreds of thousands of us go and die for a lie. Right? Fast forward to the labor union movement. Right? And this mentality of divide and conquer is so strong now that you got labor leaders who aren't even the elite. Right? They're just labor leaders trying to fight for better wages and working conditions for their workers. You got labor leaders falling prey to it, don't want to integrate their union. Well, we can't have black and Chinese and Mexican labor in our union. It'll, it'll reduce the professionalism of the working class. No fool. It'll double the size of your union. And that might help when y'all go out on strike. Right? 
Because when you go out on strike, if you don't have those people of color next to you on the strike line, guess what happens? The boss hires them to replace your happy ass. And then instead of getting mad at the boss, you get mad at the black and brown folks who were hired to replace you, who they couldn't have replaced you if you just hadn't gone along with that divide and conquer shit from the beginning. Right? So it tricked people into, again, acting against their interests. Fast forward, it's the same thing today. When you say, all we got to do is build a wall, but only on that border, not that border. You never have the Minutemen out, you know, camped off the coast of Nova Scotia in dinghies with guns shooting at crafty Canadians coming across the border to take advantage of our superior health care. Because that would be weird. Right? Say, if you just build a wall, everything, will, the jobs will come back and your wages will go. Really? Is that how you think capitalism works? <laughs> really? You think, that, you think the bosses of America are just sitting around right now going, damn it, I hope they don't think about building a wall because if they build that wall, I'm going to have to give everybody a raise. Is that how capitalism works? Capitalists just like, get, you think of the wall, they're like, damn it, okay. Here's a bonus. I'll bring the jobs back for you now, white man. You got me. You know, that's not how capitalists operate. You know what capitalists do? You build a wall, all that does is stop labor from being mobile. It doesn't stop capital. Nobody's going to stop capital. Donald Trump will say that, well, I'm going to make them stay. But Congress is like, no, no, you're not. No, you're not, right? And so capital will continue to be mobile. Capital will always cross borders in search of the highest rate of return. Goods will continue to cross borders in a global economy in search of the highest price. But if you don't allow labor to cross border in search of the highest wage, Econ 101 will tell you you have just tilted the game against workers and in favor of capital permanently. And not just labor at the south of the border, labor to the north as well. Because now you can't build the solidarity that you would need in a global economy to push for higher wages or better working conditions for any working people. Divide and conquer, and it is still working. This is why you have to understand the predicate to understand anything that you see right now, because it will not not make sense. And if you don't understand that history, going back to Baldwin's quote about people who imagine history flatters, and this whole immigration thing is about that, right? The only reason that white folks trip, and it is mostly white folks, although white anti-immigrant groups will always find one black pastor. They'll always find one black pastor or a handful of black pastors to get up and bash brown folks. Right? And they'll put them right at the front of the rally. Now, it's not because that's the black community's feeling, but that's this one guy who may or may not have a constituency, and it allows that white racist individual to say, see, I'm not racist, because a black guy say it. Right? So again, that's divide and conquer, too, of a different kind. That's dividing black and brown folks, rather than allowing them to see they share a common font of pain. Right? But the whole immigration thing is about white people not knowing our history or lying to ourselves about it, because this is what we do. We say things like this. Well, I, I, I don't mind them coming if they would just come legally like my ancestors. Okay, what the hell? <laughs> the hell does that even mean? Legally like your ancestors. Okay, here's the deal. When your ancestors came, there was no law to stop them. So if your great, great, great whatever doesn't break a law that didn't even exist, I don't have to pat them on the back and congratulate them for their law abidingness. There was no law they could have violated. In fact, the only law in the books for most of that time was the Naturalization Act of 1790, which was the first law passed by the United States Congress after the ratification of the Constitution. And what did that say? That law said all free white persons and only free white persons can become citizens of the United States. That was the law that my great, great whatever didn't break. Well, <laughs> how the hell do you break it? It's not a law. So we say that. We don't really mean it, right? Or we'll say things like, well, you know, the difference, and we must be clear on this, the difference is that our ancestors came in search of freedom. <laughs> But those people are just coming for stuff. <laughs> now, first of all, our people didn't come for freedom. Are you kidding? Freedom? If we had come for freedom, we would have established freedom. And not just for enslaved people for whom we didn't establish freedom, not just indigenous people for whom we didn't establish freedom, even for other white people in the colonies, because the colonies are some of the most unfree places on earth if you were the wrong kind of Christian or, once again, suspected of witchcraft. Right? <laughs> right? So we didn't come for freedom. We came for stuff. We came for land. We came for stuff. We came, and here's the thing we really don't like, but again, the past matters. We came because we were the losers of Europe. See, when Donald Trump announced his candidacy, he said, well, they're not sending their best. What do you think? England sent their best? 
the hell? The best didn't leave, yo. They stayed put. Why the hell would the best leave? The best don't get on the boat. Well, you think like in 1642, there was like some British aristocrat who gathered his family around the dinner table and was like, all right, children, um, here's the thing. Uh, I've been thinking about this. And well, I know you like our house here, right? You like this castle. We got lots of gold. Uh, you remember last week, we were at the king's palace. I know it was great, right? It was great. You played with his children. It was fantastic, right? I know it's brilliant. It's brilliant. It's great. Um, but here's the thing. I've been giving this a lot of thought. I've consulted with your mom. Not a lot, because it is 1647, and I don't have to do that. <laughs> but, but after giving it some careful consideration, I've decided that uh, in spite of all this that we have and how fantastic it is, uh, to hell with it, we're going to get on a boat. A rickety old ship. I don't even know if it's seaworthy. Like, it might sink. We could be kidnapped by pirates, eaten by sharks. We could die of scurvy. But, children, uh, I think if we make it to the other side and we survive, you will agree that it will have been a fabulous adventure. Okay, that shit did not happen. Right? The winners didn't get on the boat. The losers, and I don't mean losers in any pejorative sense. I don't mean it to be negative. All right, there's, 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 there's something valuable about being the loser and saying, to hell with that, I'm going to strike out and start over again. That's the best part of America, right? Is that America is a place where one can try to have a second chance, whether one was forced to be here against your will and has to make something out of nothing, make a way out of no way, or whether this was your land in the first place that got jacked from you and you're having to do the same, or whether you came, quote unquote, voluntarily. Even the voluntary were desperate, as James Baldwin said, they were they were criminals, they were convicts, they were hungry, they were starving, they couldn't make it where they were and they had no choice. Here's the problem, if we don't know that about ourselves because we're so busy on Ancestry.com trying to find the royalty in our lineage. And I've done that, man. It's, I'm, you know, I'm not going to out other people for stuff I didn't do. When I trace that, it's intoxicating, man. You hit that name and that leaf starts to turn and you're just like, come on. It's like a... It's like you're playing slot machines. You're like, come on, give me <laughs> all strawberries. I want all cherries. I want, come on, big money, you know, and then you see the, the leaf, and then it's like King Summer. You're like, hot damn, like, like they're going to roll out the red carpet for you if you go to Windsor Palace. Be like, come on in. It's been a long time. I'm not going to do that. Right? But if we are locked in a mentality of specialness, and that's part of that white superiority complex, right? If we're locked in the idea that our people came for these high-minded principles rather than out of desperation, then it makes it harder for us to see ourselves in the new immigrant. It makes us harder for us to see ourselves in them and to see them in us. And we make this inherent division between us when, in fact, folks coming from across that border or from anywhere on earth are coming for the very same reasons. The very same reasons, but we can't see it because we told ourselves a lie. This is all incredibly dangerous. It's incredibly dangerous because you can't solve the real problems if you're misdiagnosing the source of the pain. The pain is real, right? But it's like if you have a pain on your side, I'm the worst about this, by the way, so I'm in, I'm in a position to, like, I know of what I speak. If you have some kind of pain, I wake up sometimes with back pain, I'm like, uh-oh. You know, it's not that I'm 48 and shit happens. Like, no, I'm like, oh, it's something terminal, you know. <laughs> if I have, like, a headache, I'm like, shit, it's an aneurysm. You know, it's not, <laughs> it's not likely. An I'll go and consult Dr. Google, which is a terrible idea. Dr. Google doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. Dr. Google will have you convinced you're going to be dead by the morning, so I stopped <laughs> consulting Dr. Google, right? But, but seriously, like, that doesn't mean the pain isn't real. Like, if you have a pain in your side and you're convinced it's cancer, just because it's probably not cancer doesn't mean you're not in pain. We need to attend to the pain, but we have to insist on a proper diagnosis. And you can't actually solve the problem if you don't do that, right? The problem, I got this email from this guy a year and a half ago, this young white kid. He's like, I can't find a job because black and brown folks are taking all the jobs and the economy. And again, you know, I did that thing I told you before about, you know, wh you know what jobs are twice as likely to be unemployed, three times as likely to be poor? Where the hell are these jobs in Second Life? Where are these? Are they, they on Minecraft or in some video game or some shit? Like... You know, where are they taking these jobs? Clearly, that's not true, but more importantly, I needed to tell him, and I did, you know, that you might be having a hard time finding a job. I'm not diminishing the reality of what you're talking about, but what's the real problem? The real problem is there are 37 people in this country, 37 people in this country who have the same amount of wealth as the bottom 50% of all Americans combined, right? 37 people. There are six people that happen to be members of the Walton family, the Walmart heirs, five of whom were born into the family, one of whom married in. Six people named Walton... Heirs to the Walmart fortune have the same amount of wealth as the bottom 40% of the American population, 130 million people. 
Now, that can't be about merit. Right? You don't really think that the Waltons are just that damn smart, right? There are 400 white people that have the same amount of wealth as all 40 million black people combined. Let me repeat, 400 white people with the same collective net worth of all 40 million black folks in this country. There are 53 people on the planet that have the same collective net worth as the bottom half of humanity, three and a half billion people. So there's your problem. We have an economic system that was not created for about 99.999% of all humanity. We have an economic system that is about serving those at the top and to hell with everybody else. It doesn't really matter if you're white now. It'll tell you that you have something superior about you. It'll give you what W.E.B. Du Bois called the psychological wage of whiteness. I might not have much, but at least I'm not black. I might not have much, but at least I'm not brown. And then you'll vote for a guy who promises to elevate you above them. And then you're shocked when he turns around and does exactly what he said he was going to do by cutting your health care. Oh, now, hold on a minute. What? You're going to cut the you're going to cut the Affordable Care Act. I thought you were just going to cut Obamacare. OK. <laughs> First off, you know, don't consult Google for medical advice, but consult it for that shit, right? And then you say, but wait, I didn't think you meant me. See, really what these white folks are saying was, I just thought you were going to kick all of those people off, right? Even though some of the most ACA-dependent communities are precisely these white working class communities, right, that were just a little too well off to qualify maybe for Medicaid in some cases, but not well off enough to pay for their own health care. They're the ones who were benefited in relative terms probably the most, right? And, but because they were so high on that psychological wage, that, that sense of to hell with all these people, right? And because they were looking for a scapegoat, because really, let's be honest, what happened was if white folks had, been, had developed an expectationalism that my life will be at an 8, 9, or 10 as long as I work hard, and now it's only at a 5, I don't know what to make of that. I've got to find somebody to blame. Right? Whereas if I'm a person of color and I've been told, yeah, you know, an eight is attainable, but you're going to have to bust ass. You're going to have to hustle. You're going to have to grind to get to that eight. If I'm a person of color and I'm already at a six, I might be like, well, hell, you know, things are looking up. I just got to keep at it. But if I'm white and you told me I was going to be at an eight and now I'm 45 and I'm only at a five and three quarters, it's like, what the hell is going on here? Right? So it's all about relative deprivation. White folks are still far better off, and yet there was a survey taken three or four years ago which found that whites were the most pessimistic group in America about their futures. Think about that. Whites the most pessimistic and black folks the most optimistic. Now, how is that? When black folks have one-fifteenth the net worth of white folks, when black folks have double the unemployment rate, three times the poverty rate, eight years less life expectancy, double the rate of infant mortality, double the rate of low birth weight children, how in the hell can that group actually look around and go, all right, we're going to keep at it. And then white folks who have half the unemployment, one third the poverty, 15 times the net worth, half the rate of uh, low birth weight children, half the rate of infant mortality, and nine years or eight years more life expectancy, all of those things, twice as much of the good stuff, half of the bad stuff, white folks look around and go, holy hell, the wheels are coming off. <laughs> the only way that that makes sense is because whiteness is for the first time in the last 10 years or so, certainly the last eight, with President Obama, whiteness is being interrogated in ways it's never been. And if you're used to the he hegemonic dominance of your identity where it never gets questioned, it's not just that you have the disproportionate power, it's that it's hegemonic, it's not ever interrogated. The old saying used to be, you know, being white means never having to think about it. But that's actually not true lately, is it? Because to be white, you know, you do have to. Folks are using terms like white privilege, and it's freaking some people out. Even Bill O'Reilly dedicated three nights of his television show three years ago to debunk white privilege. Now, you know that's heavy stuff, because if you've got to spend three days debunking something, you know that your ass failed miserably the first two nights. And that's why you came back. The third, I've got to try again. And here's the thing. You wouldn't even try to debunk something if you didn't know that it had some possible validity. Like, you wouldn't have Bill O'Reilly have a show that says, tonight and tomorrow and Wednesday, I'm going to do units and, and segments on debunking the claim that I heard this morning that Godzilla is rampaging in downtown New York City. Like, you would not even bother with that because you would know that was absurd. So the fact that whiteness is being called out, the fact that whiteness is being put under a microscope, the fact that we had four things happening at once when Barack Obama was elected. First, you get a man of color as president. That was enough to shake some folks up, particularly because he has an exotic name, right? And he was from Hawaii, which I gather a lot of white people think is just a tourist destination, forgot it was a state. Um, <laughs> Um, and you had an economic meltdown that was confronting white America for the first time in 80 years with double-digit unemployment. We were not used to that. Black and brown folks, that was called Monday. But for white people, that, 
right? That was normative in communities of color, but for white folks, that was something we hadn't dealt with since the Depression. So you got Obama, number one, economic meltdown, number two. Third thing, popular culture, thoroughly multicultural now, challenging what it means to be part of American culture. There's some of us in this room old enough to remember how fast that multiculturalism in pop culture has happened in relative terms. We can remember when MTV, well, first of all, we can remember when MTV played music. So that's number one. But number two, we can remember when they would not play music by black artists. Michael Jackson was the first and for a long time the only one. They slipped a Prince video in there and then they were like, no, we can't do that again. And then they backed off, right, for a minute. Then they finally started playing some. And now popular culture is thoroughly interwoven thoroughly interwoven in just one generation, really that happened, right? So if you got a black president and economic insecurity and the culture shifting beneath your feet and the demographic change, which we know in 30 years will confront us with a country that is half people of color and half white, some white folks are not ready, right? Because all of that's happening at once. You put that in a blender, that's a perfect storm of white anxiety, right? I know I'm mixing my metaphors, blenders and storms, but you get it, right? It's a perfect, perfect, perfect situation for white anxiety. And that's why Tea Party was like, I want my country back. Because we've been encouraged to think of it as ours. That's why you get the red hats with the make America great again, because you want to go back to a time that you may not even remember, but you know that whiteness and conventional masculinity and heterosexuality and cisgendered normativity and Christian hegemony were not questioned. All of that's being questioned at once too, right? So all of a sudden you've got Christians who are having to deal with pluralism, you're getting straight and cisgendered folks having to deal with LGBT, LGBTQ liberation movements, right? You got men in a, in a very conventional masculine sense having to deal with yet another iteration of feminism coming down the block, intersectional feminism, which really scares us, right? Because now we get some people together and it's not all in our own silos, so now what? All of that's happening at once and people who have never been put under the microscope don't know how to respond. I would suggest that what we have is a public health crisis in white America, right? This meltdown, this collective meltdown is a public health crisis and it threatens to take down not only people of color but even most of those white folks because they'll never solve the real problem if they keep diagnosing the pain incorrectly. That's the bad news. Here's the good news and then I'm done. The good news is I know how this movie ends or I like to think that I know how this movie ends. And I could be wrong, but <clears throat> you know, there's a video, I have it on my website. If you scroll, look for it or search for it, you can probably find it. You can find it on YouTube because that's where I found it. There's an interview that James Baldwin did in 1963 with Kenneth Clark, the great sociologist. And in that interview, Clark is asking Baldwin, right, do you consider yourself an optimist or a pessimist? Right? And, and Baldwin starts off, first he takes a drag off a cigarette because it was, first of all, he's Jimmy Baldwin, so he did that. And secondly, because it's 1963 and you could smoke in the studio still. So he takes a drag off his cigarette and then he, uh, he sort of sighs real heavily and he says to Kenneth Clark, he says, I really wish you hadn't asked me that question. But since you did, I'll try and answer it. And then he pauses and he pauses and he pauses. And he says, you know, I guess I have to be an optimist because I'm alive. And to be a pessimist is to decide that life is an academic matter. And it's not. What he was saying in that, I believe, is that we have an obligation, as he wrote elsewhere in Nobody Knows My Name, we have an obligation to confront the conundrum of life and by doing so to earn our death. What he was saying is that we have obligations as human beings to continue to fight. And the only way that you continue to fight in most instances is if you believe there is a chance that your fighting will succeed and that it will mean something, that it will count for something. And so even though I am not optimistic enough to suggest that I know for sure how the movie ends, I'd like to think I do, and here's how. Back in December, I had the opportunity to go into Washington, D.C. Um, and so this was you know, after the election, but before the inauguration. And I was in there for an event, and then I had time to go to the Museum of African American History and Culture, the new, newly opened museum on the mall. If you have a chance to go, you should certainly do it. It's an extraordinary um, building, an extraordinary set of, of, uh, of exhibits. And I want to spoil it for you, but it's incredibly powerful. You start off, you go down 10 stories. It, they dug a hole in the ground. It goes down 10 stories. And you go down there, and it starts off in slave ships, essentially. You start off at the beginning of the Middle Passage, and you rise up 10 stories until you're finally where the light hits you again. So it's symbolic of the rise and the uplift of black people. So it's just that alone is incredibly stunning and brilliant, right? But what was really interesting is you get a sense there and keep in mind where this museum is. If you, haven't, if you don't know or you haven't seen the layout of it, it is 500 yards from the White House. It is the last museum before you get over to the Washington Monument. The White House is right there. So it's that close to where Donald Trump lives. And what's interesting is, right, 
And what's interesting, and Donald Trump is going to go so he can meet with Frederick Douglass, who he apparently thinks, <laughs> who he apparently thinks is still alive, in case you didn't catch that. He said yesterday, Frederick Douglass has been doing some great things, and he's getting noticed more and more for it. Right? Um, oh, Jesus. Um, but there it is right there, and it's a really interesting contrast, right? Because think about what Donald Trump represents, and I don't just mean like the obvious political stuff and ideological. I mean, he represents a, a train of thought in American history that's very common, right? Which is sort of the great man theory of history, right? We've all been exposed to the great man theory. It's what we're taught in junior high school and high school history classes, right? This idea that history is shaped by great individuals, whether it's great inventors or founding fathers or war heroes or philanthropists and billionaires, right? It's always great and, and it's usually great men that's why they call it the great man theory right and Donald Trump clearly buys into that right during the campaign he said I alone can defeat Isis I alone can bring the jobs back I alone can solve your problem right and so he's very much bought into that but that's not just a rap on Donald Trump he, he's part of the culture he's learned the lesson well of the society but right there in that museum you see a very different theory of social change and how history is made because in that museum it's not about the great individual it's about the great collective. When you look at the exhibits in that museum, yes, you see the names and some of the stories of some of those quote unquote great men and women who've done this work, but you also see the stories of unnamed people whose names you didn't know before, of the collective of SNCC and the collective of CORE and the collective of abolitionists. Yes, there's Nat Turner's Bible and he's a big name in the struggle. Yes, there's Emmett Till's casket and he is a big name as a martyr, but there's also so many stories, placards, individual things that remind you that history isn't just made by great men and or women and or folks on a gender fluid spectrum but in fact that greatness comes collectively and change is made collectively and you see it and you understand the power of it when you walk into this one room there's a statue of Thomas Jefferson there and back and it's dark it's got shadows on it and behind it is a wall big huge stone wall and inscribed on the wall are Jefferson's words from the declaration we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights among these life liberty and the pursuit of happiness and this is contrasted with his visage and then right behind him, and you don't quite know what it is at first, and they've crafted it so that you won't. There's a dark shape rising. It looks like shoeboxes, actually, is what it looks like at first. These dark shoeboxes, painted shoeboxes, made to look like um, a brick wall. It's not actually shoeboxes. It is, however, sort of fake bricks. And you get up on them, and there's hundreds of them right behind him, between him and this wall proclaiming liberty and freedom. And on the boxes are something written, and you get closer, and you see that there are names on them. Right? And as you look a little closer, if you don't know who these names are and what they represent, the docents will tell you, or the you know, written sort of uh, stanchion that's sitting there will tell you, these are the names of his enslaved persons. Right? Contrasted his visage, their names, these words. And you begin to realize that the only way that that system, that that wall, and I think it's probably quite deliberate that they chose it as such, and if not, it's a great irony of history given the president, um, that that wall, the only way that wall was torn down, not only for Jefferson's family, but more broadly was because of the work of the people whose story is then chronicled all throughout that museum, the collective, the collaborative. I guess what I'm trying to say is this. When you go into a place where you see the casket of Emmett Till, and when you go into a place where you see the Bible of Nat Turner, when you go into a place where you can see the axe handle of Georgia segregationist governor and restaurant owner Lester Maddox used to chase black people out of his restaurant with an axe handle, and it's there on display, when you see the video of Bull Connor turning dogs and hoses on black children and families in the streets of Birmingham in 63, when you see Jim Clark, the sheriff of Selma, beating up John Lewis and others on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, right, you begin to realize that black people and I would suggest people of color generally have overcome and defeated a lot bigger and a lot badder than Donald John Trump. And I'm here to tell you that if Bull Connor, if, if Bull Connor and Jim Clark and Lester Maddox and Thomas Jefferson, right, and if the killers of Malcolm and Medgar and Martin cannot stop peoples of color, there's no way in hell that this man is going to. At the end of the day, when American history is written, I suggest you bet on black. Thank you all so much for being here. I appreciate you very much. Thank you so much. So I'll take some questions.
Got about half an hour to do that, roughly, and then we'll do some, I'll sell you some merchandise. I got some books. Thank you. No, go ahead. Oh, yeah, go ahead. And then we'll no, ladies first. <laughs> go ahead. Either way. Or you can do it from there if you'd rather. Yeah, whatever you'd like to do. It does. It does. You're good. That's all right. Um, how, how do you cater your message to a, um, an audience that is not living, knowing, or receptive to the mm -hmm. um, this, this notion that right. they have? Right. Well, first off, most of my audiences are overwhelmingly white. Um, this institution in Cal State LA, where I was last week, um, are two of the few. Well, actually, I wasn't speaking there last week. I was in there, and my buddy works there, and I have spoken there several times. Um, are maybe the only two colleges other than actual HBCUs, which I don't get asked to speak to that often because I don't need to really explain racism to black people. Um, I am going to Oakwood. I am going to Oakwood in Huntsville. I have a long-standing relationship with them. I'm going there in a week or so. But but generally, the places where I speak. Um, are overwhelmingly white, and that's why I'm brought in, actually. That's, that's actually the purpose of, of me being brought in. Uh, now, as far as how they receive me, um, well, I'm here, I'm still standing. <laughs> um, and it's not because I'm real fast and run, run quickly. Um, you know, I think it's a mixed bag, and I, think, and I think here's the important thing about the mixed bag that's really important to point out. Um, so there's two sort of extreme reactions. Now, obviously, there's a lot of people that just don't give a damn either way. But, uh, you know, you get sort of two really when, when you're white and you do this work, you get two really strong reactions, and they're both unhealthy for different reasons, right? One is, of course, the how dare you race traitor kind of thing. Although, in my case, I don't really get to be called a race traitor anymore because once the Nazis found out that I was Jewish, which wasn't really a secret, <laughs> you know, like saying, like somebody tweeted out yesterday, Wise is a Jew, All right? That's, that's not a secret. That's like saying that that captain guy from the Captain and Tennille never really piloted a boat. We know, we know. <laughs> It's an old reference. The young people are like, who? <laughs> Ask an older person. Um, but once they found out I was a Jew, it's like, oh, you're not a race traitor. You're just a filthy Jew. Oh, well, whatever. Um, so, uh, so, so there is that sort of how dare you give away the handshake, right? How dare you give away the code? Um, we don't actually, by the way, people of color have a handshake, just in case you <laughs> wonder, oh, really? They got a handshake? Well, maybe we do. Uh, uh, but... In any event, um, so there's that, and that's unhealthy because with that comes a lot of hostility. With that comes death threats. With that comes, you know, people doxing me online and putting my address out there for everyone to find, and that has been done. Uh, and I got a family that I got to protect. I ain't worried about me, but I'm worried about them. So there's that piece. That sucks. But what also sucks is the other extreme, right, um, which feels a lot better, but it's not any better. It's not any healthier in a lot of ways. And that is the, oh, my God, I never thought of that before response of white people, which is weird, right? Because black people have been saying this for a really long time. Brown folks have been saying this for a really long time. Uh, and all of a sudden, the white guy comes along. It's like, you're a genius. <laughs> well, no, I just listened really well. And I mean, I'll take credit for the timing and, and like the, you know, the presentation stuff. I can own a piece of that, I suppose. But like the factual stuff, this is black and brown wisdom. And, and white people have just been dismissing it. So even though I don't like getting death threats, I also don't like getting pats on the back as like, oh my God, you're so, you're so, well, how did you come up with that? Well, you know, I need to read all of your books. Well, of course, I want you to read all of my books, but I also want you to read the books, the, the articles, the essays, the poems, watch the videos of and the documentary films of people of color because that's the font of the wisdom. And so I think that's the reaction. And then the final piece, which is, uh, what was it? Um, Oh, yes. The, the, so here's the thing. The content, the basic core content of my talks 
um, does not vary considerably based on audience because I think truth is truth and it needs to be spoken. So I don't change up the content unless, of course, I've been asked to give a speech specifically about um, HR policy in a corporation setting or, or very narrowly focused on healthcare delivery. And then, of course, you know, it's a little different. But the basic core arguments and concepts don't vary. The style, of course, varies, right? Clearly, I do not go into a corporate setting and do what I just did. Right? Um, I know my audience and I know how to read my audience and I know how to respond to the energy of an audience. So when I go to those places, um, I'm, I have a slightly different approach. I mean, my verbiage and my cadence never really changes, but my approach of um, just sort of like the level of humor that I'll use, like I tried, like some companies are okay with that. You can get away with that stuff at like some of the hipper companies, but then I tried that at an event for Daimler Chrysler and it was like all these German business people in the room and every joke that you all thought was hilarious, they were like, mm-hmm, how much more time do we have to do this? You know, and as a Jew and them being Germans, I was like, okay, I'll stop the humor. Uh, I'll stop if it bothers you, right? And so, uh, so, so the style changes, the content doesn't. I would never want to shift the fundamental core content. It's always about white denial. It's always about historical ignorance. It's always about predicates and, and knowing the past. It's always quoting James Baldwin a lot, uh, regardless of the audience, even though I know that there will be you know, some white people who are like, which Baldwin brother is he? And so then... Um, <laughs> You know, I, I know that that happens, and uh, you just sort of roll with it, you know. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Um, I guess I wanted to ask you in regards to the destruction of the African-American families back in the 20s, whenever they, uh, you know, okay, you can't get any money unless your husband is, you know, not with you, you're divorced, and they don't live there, and that sort of progression about that. Because that's something that is, you know, when I, when I tell people this particular aspect of, of our governmental history, they are like, what? No, that never happened. That's not possible. You know, so I was, you know, wondering what your thoughts are on the subject and, you know, your, your, your background knowledge. Are you talking about man in the house laws and that yeah. kind of thing for mm -hmm. social programs? Yeah. So, yeah, it wouldn't have been in the 20s, but it would have been after yeah. the Social Security Act was passed. Mm -hmm. One of the ways that, and that was in 35, one of the ways okay. that, um, that the state was able to exclude black people. There were a lot of ways that they did it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one, well, first off, a couple of things they did, right, was the Social Security Act itself, which creates Social Security and creates a lot of these programs, including what we now call, um, uh, what we did call AFDC for a long time, what we now call TANF, um, was called ADC at the time. And, and, and these programs were essentially off limits to black folks because in the case of Social Security, for instance, if you were domestic labor, worked in someone else's home, you didn't qualify for Social Security retirement benefits or disability. If you were an agricultural laborer working in the fields as like a sharecropper, you didn't qualify. Well, it just so happens 81 or 82 percent of all black workers in America worked in those fields so, or in houses. So that meant they were excluded functionally till 55 when the law was changed, or 56. Um, as far as ADC, which became AFDC, and then later, same thing with other forms of, of benefits, food stamps, SSI, um, what we now call SNAP as far as food stamps are concerned, states began to pass these man-in-the-house laws that essentially um, said that if there is a man in the house, you can't get benefits because that man should be supporting you. And so essentially, you have to be a single parent, right, in order to qualify for these paltry ass benefits in the first place. These benefits are not, you know, worth much. And even at the time of welfare reform being passed, they were only averaging about $327 a month in cash benefits. And in some states, they were considerably below that. Right now in the state of Texas, food stamp benefits come to about $198 a month, $189 a month, I think, per family of three. So they're pitiful amounts. But in order to even qualify for them, you had to have no man in the house. So a lot of what we consider this sort of single parent pathology right, was actually demanded by the state, right? It was essentially the idea that, well, you know, if you, if, if, if you should be dependent on a man, which, of course, first of all, all assumes heteronormativity, and, you know, there's a lot of problems with it. But the, problem, the other problem was if the man was struggling, if the man was unemployed, and the woman was unemployed or not making enough money and needed benefits, you ultimately had to move out of the house. And then, of course, we then blame those women for being pathological and being trifling and not wanting to have, you know, uh, uh, functional families and all this stuff instead of realizing that that was, that was really, you know, forced. And we, there were some other things we did, too. It wasn't just man-in-the-house laws. It was also um, laws that for every dollar that you earned, 
right, in paid labor, you would lose a dollar of benefits. Now, think about this for just a minute. Like the incentive, if you're, if you're receiving some form of social welfare benefit and you're trying to find work, in order to transition to work, if you lose dollar for dollar, there's virtually no incentive to go out and try to work because it's just going to make you worse off. And so even if you're not lazy, it's just rational, right, for you to be like, well, why would I do that? and still make the same lousy amount of money, as opposed to what we had done for a minute. There was a period of time before this was changed. It was in the 70s where they actually had a thing that was like a disregard. So for every dollar that you earned, you only lost 30 cents of benefits or something. So you got to keep two-thirds of every dollar. So that incentive then was to go out and work more, because you would still get to keep two-thirds of the benefit and the new dollar that you earn. But then the Reagan administration comes in, changes that, gets rid of the disregard rules, and makes it where you lose dollar for dollar. So naturally, it comes to a point where there's no real incentive uh, to get a job, uh, even if there are jobs available, which usually there were not, and that's why people were on these lousy benefits in the first place. But there's no incentive if you're going to get punished dollar for dollar for everything that happens, especially if you still got to come up with childcare money, right? Especially if getting that job means I got to pay for childcare and that's not covered. So if I lose dollar for dollar, why would I do that? Or I'm going to lose my health care benefits under Medicaid. Why would I do that? Like, you know, so a lot of what we did in, in our welfare programs, far from being generous and thus creating quote unquote dependence. Actually, whatever dependence was created, and that's a horrible term to use because in fact, the vast majority are off the programs in very short periods of time, despite the stereotypical beliefs of intergenerational welfare receipt, which are simply not the norm. But um, whatever dependence was fostered was fostered by the stinginess of the programs. It was fostered by the reactionary nature of the rules. It was not fostered because they were too generous. It was fostered precisely because they were not. Yeah. I guess one last question um, in regards leading into that, what you just said. Uh, can you speak on your, your concepts or your understandings of generational poverty and the way that it affects folks in terms of long-term existence in different locations? You know, some may say like in Louisiana or, or places like that. Well, you know, that's the thing. Intergenerational welfare receipt isn't true, but intergenerational poverty can be. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, that's a function of economic mobility and opportunity in places like New Orleans, places like Houston, places like Newark, mm -hmm. places like Baltimore, places like Atlanta, all over the country country, you had um, a lot of what we now look at as intergenerational poverty was the result, again, of macroeconomic policy done in the cities. So we talk, I talked about this in an earlier session today, urban renewal. You had 25 percent of all black housing knocked to the ground between 1950 and 1969 to make way for interstates, to make way for office parks, to make way for, for shopping malls, to make way for uh, office buildings or, or, or whatever. And, um, and that was hundreds of thousands of people who were displaced, whose businesses were knocked to the ground. So then when you reduce the amount of housing stock in the black community, and you reduce the amount of black businesses in the community, and you've got banks that won't loan to those people who want to open new ones, you then force people to double up in crowded housing or move into public housing for the first time. That all begins to happen. Keep in mind, the Fair Housing Act is passed in 1968 which theoretically makes all that discrimination illegal. But by 1973, what's happening? Well, actually, two things happen. You get the Fair Housing Act right at the time that housing prices are tripling in this country. So, and why were housing prices tripling? They were tripling because we created such a demand for housing because of the FHA and the VA loans and the GI Bill benefits for white people. We create all this demand for housing. That sends the prices up. Then all of a sudden, when black folks can finally get in the game, because the Fair Housing Act has been passed, now they can't afford the house. You can't technically discriminate against them, even though we know it still happens. But even if, even if you can't discriminate, now they're priced out of the market. And we say, oh, well, you just can't afford it. Well, OK, but the only reason I can't is because you created an artificial market for housing. You blew up the prices. Then by 73, the manufacturing jobs that were in those urban core cities begin to evaporate and then begin to shift to suburban service sector economy. We defund the hell out of public transportation so folks in the city core can't get to the jobs that are now in the suburbs or they begin to go overseas. So right at the moment that black and brown folks begin to at least theoretically gain access to moving up and out of poverty, that door is shut by other means. And so then we end up with two or three generations of folks that might be unable to get up out of poverty, not because of their own character defects, not because of dependence on government benefits, but because of a macroeconomic policy, everything from trade policy to monetary policy to fiscal policy to housing policy to transportation policy, all sort of conspiring in a colorblind way. None of this, it wasn't like people sat down and were like, let's figure out the greatest way that we can do this to screw people. They just, they did it for straight economic reasons, but the consequences of it were to disproportionately affect some and, and not others. So essentially structural violence. Right, it is structural violence, yes. Right. Thank other you questions, much. you bet, other questions please. So, from just 
one half Jew to another, Shalom. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, so you did a great job of talking about the past and how we got to where we are now. Yeah. But uh, for myself as a, future ed as a future educator and for my fellow students, yeah. um, as the future of America, would you have any tips or recommendations of what we can do going forward to be able to make this country and world a better place? Um, well, I mean, obviously we're all going to have very different roles to play, and the important thing is there's no shortage of such roles to play. I think people who are going to be teachers have a particular role to play, telling the truth to their students, empowering their students to speak their truth, um, and to never be satisfied with the narratives that the culture gives them. For those who are going to start businesses, you have the capacity to build into the process of your business, whatever you begin and whatever you might start. Um, this notion of equity and fairness and justice, casting the net for employees much wider than maybe we normally do when we rely on old boys' networks works. Um, if you're going to be a doctor or a nurse, you have the ability to train yourself on your own subconscious biases and find out how that affects the delivery of health care. You can find out about that. You can learn all the ways that sometimes even really well-intended people fall prey to subtle and subconscious bias, and that affects the way they treat others who are different than themselves. Even if you're going to be a, if you're going to be a cop, if you're going to be whatever it is, like I want people who are going to be police officers to have a sense of this history, right? Because if I know, if I understand as a cop why black and brown folks Folks don't trust me and by the way not just if I'm a white cop because James Baldwin also said growing up in Harlem the worst cops were black cops because they had something to prove to the white folks who were above them on the chain of command and so it's not just white cops that people of color fear so I need to know that though because if I'm an officer and I know the history then I don't I don't respond to the fear of someone in the neighborhood as a sign of suspicion I don't say, oh, you turned around and went the other way when you saw me. You must have drugs on you. You must have a gun. So it's about training them. Um, I think every, regardless of what career, what kind of profession you go into, there's an opportunity to bring a lens of equity and justice um, to the work. And, and with that has to come a lens of humility about all the things that we don't know and are still learning uh, as we try to help other people learn. And I think if we come with a proper sense of humility and a sense of wonder and a sense of willingness to learn from other people as well as teach other people uh, and bring others along with us that we can get pretty far in a lot of areas uh, regardless of what area that might be. And I, but the key is having a color conscious approach having an approach that recognizes the way that identity matters and shapes our own perceptions, how it shapes the perceptions of others, how it shapes the experiences of others, and how it shapes our own. And if we have a color conscious mindset that takes that into consideration, it'll change the way that we evaluate employees, It'll change the way that we evaluate students in a classroom. It'll change the way that we evaluate patients in a hospital or a doctor's office. It'll change the way that we evaluate faculty on a search committee when we're trying to fill a faculty slot. It changes everything to have that color conscious, context specific approach as opposed to a colorblind, context neutral approach which leads us astray most of the time. Thank you. Yeah, you bet, thank you. Hi, colorblind came out at a relatively early part of the Obama presidency, and I just wondered how you would write on that material, how you would approach the book at this point as opposed to circa right. 2009, 2010, especially in light of right. such increasingly pointed measures by the president to address race head on. Right. Two, how do we have a conversation about white privilege and white denial with people who are primed to react against and even deny it? Well, I mean, the, the, I'll take the last part first because it's actually a little easier and a little shorter answer. For, for white people who were trying to convince people it's one thing, for people of color it's another and it's obviously harder. I don't recommend that folks of color spend an inordinate amount of your day trying to convince white people that there's a thing called white privilege. Um, just like I don't think I don't think it's real helpful for women to spend a whole lot of time trying to convince dudes that mis misogyny is real and rape culture is real because folks who are marginalized have to protect themselves, have to defend themselves, have to fight for themselves regardless of what the, the, those at the top of the system do. I think that's more my job, let's say, than, than it would be a person of color's job. But um, having said that, I do think there are approaches that work regardless of who it is. And for me, if it's somebody who's really sort of having a hard time hearing it and not sort of open and blocking it, um, my experience has been that telling personal stories and narratives about my own privilege and about my own examples of privilege is a far better approach than sharing a bunch of data and information. Like in a group setting like this, I'll throw out a bunch of facts and history and analysis, but in a one-on-one -on -one or like a conversational setting where, or a classroom semester where you're talking about this stuff, I think it's really important to share stories. So a lot of times, and I didn't do it tonight, but a lot of times I do that also. I talk about you know, my own um, 
very extensive history of drug use and illegality and things for which I did not get arrested and did not go to jail precisely because being white I was insulated from the suspicion of law enforcement even when they had every reason that they should have searched me and found what was in the car and if they had done that I got stopped huh, uh, in Gonzales, Texas coming back from San Antonio on the way back to New Orleans after a uh, debate tournament at UTSA in 1987 in a car with my debate partner another debate team and the debate coach I was going eight miles over the speed limit. I got pulled over, the um, cop comes to the door, and I know what's in the car. I know that in the briefcase of my debate coach is an ounce and a half of weed, uh, an eight ball of Coke, about 12 sheets of acid, and probably 14 hits of ecstasy. I don't think you have to be an expert on Texas law to know <laughs> that uh, that's enough to send me away forever, <laughs> forever. Um, and, and, and when the cop came to the door and I couldn't find my license because I was nervous as hell and I'm, I'm fumbling through my wallet and I couldn't find it and, I, and it seemed like it took 30 minutes. I'm sure it was only 30 seconds. And he has the light and he says, why don't you come back to the cruiser and light's better back there. I'm like, okay. So I come back there and he's right, that light is a lot brighter. <laughs> and, 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 I'm, and I'm looking through and I come across my fake ID and he says, isn't that it? I'm like, no, 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 no. That is something else. That is something else. And finally, just as he's reaching for it, because he knows I'm lying to him, I find the real one, and he does not search the car in spite of how nervous I was. And, uh, and that's the reason I'm here tonight, by the way. Um, but, but so I tell those stories, and there are millions of others that I could tell like that, and that I encourage us to tell, because I think we need to point out the absurdity of how we get away with shit and the absurdity of this system. And so I think those examples, because everybody's got stories like that, maybe not exactly like a car full of drugs in Gonzales, but, <laughs> but, but everybody's got a story um, about something, and, and I think the more honest we are, the more effective. As far as the book Colorblind, I think the critique of the president, uh, the last president, um, still stands, and I think, I know, when I said it, I meant it, and I don't think that uh, in, in any way diminished over the course of the rest of his presidency. I wrote the book, and it was released in 2011, well, uh, Between Barack and a Hard Place was released on inauguration day of 09, Colorblind was released in 2010, or beginning of 2011. Um, and the critique was simply saying, listen, there is a long-standing tradition, of which the president at that time was just one part, the latest iteration, of trying to downplay racial issues in favor of a more universalistic or possibly class-based analysis. The idea that we don't want to talk about racial disparities in health care, we just want to get health care for everybody. We don't want to talk about racial disparities in unemployment, we just want to make sure we have jobs. We don't want to talk about racial disparities in education, we just want to make sure all the schools are well-funded. And as I explain in the book, that does not work to solve racial gaps. In fact, it can make racial gaps worse by taking our eye off of the cause of those things. And then the problem is if we're not talking about racism in those areas, then the ongoing inequality allows us to look at those on the bottom and say there's something wrong with them. At least if I'm talking about the racial disparities and the racism, then I can blame it on something. If I don't have an understanding of what's causing it, I look at those people who are sicker, who are less educated, who are more likely in jail, who are more likely unemployed, and I go something's wrong with them. So my concern about the president's approach, which I understood from a political perspective, I understood from the I want to get elected president perspective, why he did it. I did not understand why after re-election he continued to do it until I came to the realization two years after the book was released, or a year and a half after the book was released, that he actually believes it. And I think that the president, for all of his strengths, um, really did come to believe, and, and, and maybe he had to. Maybe this is the only logical worldview that would allow him to go on. I get it. Um, I think if you tell yourself as a condition of getting elected first to the state legislature in Illinois and then to the you know, United States Senate and then president, if you tell yourself um, long enough that racism isn't really a huge obstacle, like he did in 04 when he gave that convention speech in Boston at the D Democratic convention and said, you know, we're not a white America, black America, Latino America, or Asian America, we're just the United States of America. In addition to being a very clear and sort of, I thought, cheap applause line, um, I didn't think he believed it at the time, and I don't know if he did believe it at the time, but I think if you tell yourself that enough, there comes a point where you have to believe it at least a little. Maybe you believe it as an aspirational thing, and I get that, but the problem is I think it makes it harder to solve some of these problems. And I think that at the end of the day, what it has done in this case is it has removed race from the discourse to such an extent. I mean, even the stuff he did that was quote-unquote race-specific was not race-specific. My Brother's Keeper is only race-specific in the most gendered way, and it still looks at the challenges facing young black males through an economistic lens 
wins. It is still primarily looking at the issue of getting more jobs in urban areas, dealing with what William Julius Wilson called the sort of mismatch between where the jobs are and where folks live. It's not looking at institutional structural racism facing those black men. And of course, it's ignoring black women altogether virtually, which is a whole nother problem. Um, but so even the stuff when he talked about race, and I, and I get it, he got smacked down every time he talked about it, right? Yeah. But there, and, and so I'm not saying that that's his, it wasn't his unique flaw. It's just that, unfortunately, we're living in this paradigm that he, to some extent, bought into, and it complicated our ability to make the argument. I think the one good thing, if there's one thing that can be teased out of this moment, is that all that post-racial stuff now is out the window. And I think now maybe we can come back down to earth and begin to realize that if your injury is premised on identity, the conversation has to be about that identity. That if your injury is premised on who you are in the world, we have to talk about what it means to be that thing in the world. Whether that is a person of color, whether that is someone who's LGBTQ regardless of color, whether that's a working class white person, because all these folks are like, we gotta get rid of identity politics, are ignoring that white working class status is an identity. It's no less an identity than being black. It's no less an identity than being Asian American. It's no less an identity than being a Middle Eastern Muslim, right? It's just that whiteness is always considered considered itself free of identity and therefore the norm. And I think now maybe we just expand, you know, the, the, the dialogue around identity and identity's injury and be race conscious, class conscious, gender conscious, sexuality conscious, religion conscious, all of these things um, in a way that can move us forward uh, in ways that the colorblind, you know, mode just really can't do. One more and I'm done. What does an effective color conscious government structure in America look like? Well, a color conscious structure, I mean, I, I allude to some of it at the end of the book. You know, I think that we need to really be moving forward with policies and practices and procedures that would build in color consciousness to everything from budgetary decisions. So I talk about racial impact statements for budget and tax policy, education policy. One of the things I've been talking about lately that I didn't start talking about in time for that book, but I mentioned in my new book, Under the Affluence, um, near, the, near the end, is I think, let's talk about policing for a second. So what would a color conscious policing policy look like? Well. You know, other than de-policing, which I think would really be valuable to actually de-police many of these communities that are harmed by policing, uh, beyond that, which is something we have to work towards, I think it would be a really important thing to have a conversation about, you know, how we choose police. My feeling is that communities of color with a long history of subordination and marginalization at the hands of police, and I would even go so far as to say a lot of working class and poor white communities as well, ought to have, like there ought to be a threshold, you know, of, of, of economic need or, or something where if it's below that, um, the community ultimately gets to choose who polices their community. And here's how we could do it. Uh, think about if we were to say, okay, given this history of racial subordination, this community has a deep mistrust of the police and the, mis and the police have a deep mistrust and fear and suspicion of the people there because they mostly don't live there. We could try to do residency requirements and we've done that in some places and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, but rather than just doing that, how about if we were to say for, for everyone who wants to be an officer in this community, particularly a new, new officer, and there's turnover all the time, um, you have to do 60 or 90 or 120 days probationary period where you don't have the power of arrest, but you do walk the streets, you spend time getting to know people, you knock on doors, you go to the cafes, you go to the barber shops, you go to the coffee shops, you go to the churches, you go to the mosques, you sit down on people's porches, you talk to them, you show them pictures of your kid, you see pictures of theirs, you talk to each other and get to know them, you essentially serve as a community organizer for the first three months first four months. And then at the end of the three to four months, the community has a plebiscite that only they have the right to participate in, where they will decide whether or not you get to be a cop. It's not going to be the chief of police who chooses or some police commission. It's not going to be about just whether you can shoot the gun straight or pick up a heavy sack of potatoes or whatever it is they make you do or run the, you know, run a 50 yard dash in a particular time. You have to show the community to their satisfaction that you're coming in there for the right reasons rather than the wrong ones. And if you give me three months, give me three months to get to know you, I I will probably have a feel for you. And then what happens is, think about it, it's better for the community and the cops, right? Because now, not only will the community know the person and feel like, all right, that one seems pretty good. He or she seems to be committed to doing the right thing and listening to us. And then the cop feels safer too, because the cop sees people on the block and they've met them before and they know them and they've talked to them and they've met their mom and they've met their auntie and they've met the brother and the sister and the nephew and the niece. So now I'm not afraid of you when I see you because I know your name, I know what you're into, I know what music you listen to, I know what you like to do in your spare time. So there comes a point where everybody's better off. That is a profoundly color conscious approach because it requires building in the recognition recognition that the decision process, there has to be self-determination in communities that have been denied self-determination. There has to be autonomy in communities that have been stripped of autonomy and they've been stripped because of color. So that would be one example. Yes. Thank you. 
You bet. Go ahead. Hi. Um, hey. I want to present a quote to you that Jefferson writes. He says, the real distinctions which nature has made and many other circumstances will divide us into parties and produce convulsions which will probably never end but in the extermination of the one or the other race. Mm -hmm. So in bringing forth this quote, I want you to talk about the systematic you know, ways of extermination against the black and brown mm -hmm. or any type of colored person that is in place and you spoke about tactics the other seminar. Could you explain some tactics such as immunizations? We know, <clears throat> some of us know that the immunizations are filled with poison that carry deadly diseases. And at the same time, as part of the system, they want our children to get immunizations to partake in certain activities such as education. So could you explain or tell us a tactic to employ against mm -hmm. such systems of extermination? Well, let me say this first of all. I don't, I don't, we have a disagreement perhaps, I would say pretty, not just perhaps, most certainly, um, about whether immunizations are part of an extermination campaign. They're given to all white children in a way that they wouldn't be, and they're, requ and they're expected of white children in a way that wouldn't be if it was meant as some extermination campaign. That's not to say that the mercury in, in uh, vaccinations is never a cause for us to maybe you know, keep an eye on, but the, the, the research on this, the overwhelming, overwhelming bulk of the research on this certainly suggests that done properly, and they are not always done properly, but done properly, that vaccinations are not only not intended as a, as a genocidal program of extermination, but they're critical to maintaining the health of children. That doesn't mean they're perfect, and it doesn't mean we couldn't do better, but the idea that this is you know, this is a particular effort to exterminate anyone, let alone folks of color, when they're not the only ones who are, who are targeted by them, um, does, doesn't to me seem to ring true. In fact, it seems quite untrue. That doesn't mean, however, that certainly does not mean that there have not been efforts by the state to exterminate peoples of color before. There have been very deliberate efforts. If you read um, the book Medical Apartheid by Harriet Washington, um, it's a brilliant book. It came out in 20, I think 2009, 2008, now, 20, 2007, because it was right before Obama was elected. Um, Harriet Washington, Medical Apartheid, shows the history of not just the stuff we've heard about, like Tuskegee, but shows the history of the way that the CIA and um, other intelligence agencies and parts of the U.S. military deliberately released various diseases in communities, not only communities of color, but certainly working class communities and mostly communities of color, mosquitoes that were infected with yellow fever um, or were infected with various other types of toxins or the use of uh, LSD and other psychedelic drugs and other chemicals and toxins on people that were involuntarily placed into uh, mental hospitals. Uh, we certainly know sterilization, particularly of women of color in the 20th century, 70,000 that we know of, um, women of color disproportionately sterilized with the power of the state and court orders throughout the 20th century all the way up until the 1970s disproportionately black women and indigenous women um, so the state has used all types of forms and what's interesting is so much of this history isn't known that when Jeremiah Wright Reverend Jeremiah Wright in Chicago pointed this stuff out right this is what got Barack Obama in such trouble for being affiliated with him because he was talking about at least in part this history um, and and he was getting a lot of that history straight from Harriet Washington's book I mean this is what and it's all chronicled it's all documented a lot of this actually came out and was admitted by the CIA and by representatives of the government in 1975 in the church committee hearings when a lot of the history of CIA involvement in overthrowing governments and creating death squads was coming out. Also, this stuff was coming out. Um, so there's no doubt that there is a long history. And one of the things I mentioned in a, in a, in a seminar earlier today or the, the community meeting was what happened in Baltimore. You know, uh, in Baltimore, um, there was a program, and it came to light in the late 90s. You can, you can look this up as well. There was a lead abatement study that was done in Baltimore, both not public housing, but just low-income housing. It was done by the Johns Hopkins University Kennedy Krieger Institute using government money. What they did, keep in mind, you know, lead poisoning in urban communities, very prominent, right? You have lead paint going back to the 50s and 60s and early 70s before it was banned that continues to cover the walls of a lot of low-income communities. Um, and it, we know it kills. You know, it causes uh, cognitive 
cognitive uh, uh, damage. It also has an effect on impulse control, which is directly related to criminal offending. I mean, you know, lead is, is unhealthy at any level, and it's overwhelmingly black and brown poor folks exposed to it. So the uh, Johns Hopkins uh, uh, University Kennedy Krieger folks wanted to study what's the way to get rid of lead that's the most cost effective. Now to me that was the wrong question to ask. The, you know, the question is how fast can we get this damn lead out of the buildings because it shouldn't matter how much it costs, we ought to be willing to do it. It's killing children, it's destroying families, it's destroying their brain development, it's causing all kinds of problems. But of course in this society we got to figure out the cost benefit analysis. So they decided to do this study and this is what they did. They went in and they recruited black families. There were a few that weren't black but it was overwhelmingly black families to go into public uh, to go into these apartments um, and there were three different groups right? and they were given three different types of apartments in one set of apartments they had done a really good job of getting rid of the lead they had gotten rid of it they had scraped the walls they had totally rebuilt it they had restructured it they had repainted so those those folks were going into places where the lead abatement was like hundred percent virtually um, the other the second third were going into a place where they'd done a pretty good job not great sort of a middle ground job of lead abatement and the third third were going into an area where there had been virtually no lead abatement at all just the cheapest kind of lead abatement and at the end of the process what do you know the folks that went into the heavily lead infected places had greater levels of lead poisoning and greater levels of damage the people that went into the entirely lead abated places had very little damage and actually in some instances their lead levels dropped because they had come from worse places and now they were in better places but the point is this was guinea pig stuff these black families were being I mean if you got one of the one of the well-done apartments I guess you were okay but if you didn't, you were screwed. And they were, they were bribing them with, with $50 in SNAP benefits and free t-shirts and, and, and gift certificates to certain stores. This was done with government money. And um, you know, as a result, people's you know, children were poisoned. And this was all done in the name of science. Now, here's the thing about that. Do I believe that the folks at Johns Hopkins sat down and said, how can we exterminate poor black people in the city of Baltimore? No, I don't believe they did that. Um, I'm not saying that no one's ever thought that before, but I'm saying I don't believe that that's what they did. I think it's actually worse than that, because at least if it were that, right, if there's Oz behind the curtain conspiring to destroy people, you can expose Oz, right? It's easy. And when you have a conspiracy of a handful of people trying to deliberately exterminate people, it only takes one person to blow the lid on that. And the bigger the conspiracy, the harder it is to keep secrets. So that's why conspiracies generally fail and we find out about them. Um, but in this case, it's worse than a conspiracy. It's the fact that they are so utterly unconcerned and, and, and just disregard the lives of such people that to them, they can look at it and say, well, we're doing good for the community. This is science. We're going to find out how to really help you know, it's, it's so incredibly, it's so rooted in a lack of compassion and a lack of empathy and a, in a lack of recognition for the humanity of the people that you're manipulating. Um, it's rooted in a mentality of supremacy, but it's a mentality that exists at a much more subconscious level than a conscious one. It's a mentality that exists at a, at a level that is subconscious as opposed to, let's say, the mentality of of Hitlerian Nazi doctors or some of the American doctors who they took cues from who were involved in the eugenics and population control movement in the early, 19, uh, early 1900s who were more deliberate, who were very clear that they wanted to sterilize certain people so they would not make more babies and wanted to control them and wanted to reduce their population. This is actually more evil in a way because it's this banality of just sort of like not caring, not thinking, having no regard whatsoever for people and what you're doing to them. And I think to me, that's the, that's the pernicious element of pseudo-genocidal policies, is it's rarely done deliberately, but the consequences, it doesn't matter if it's deliberate. It doesn't matter if it's conspiratorial. It doesn't matter if it's intentional. The outcomes are the same. And I think really what it is, is it's what sociologists call functional, right? There's a functionalism to it. Functional, you know, functionalism in sociological theory is basically just this idea that the reason things are the way they are is because it works for people in power. Right? And, and people that don't have power don't count enough to even register in the concerns of the people who make policy. That's an evil, pernicious kind of system, and it's a very hard one to crack. You know? So what tactics do we employ? Um, I, I, well, I think the tactics that we employ, in addition to exposing that history to people, in addition to making sure people know that narrative, in addition to really telling our stories, because again, it isn't enough to just point people to a bunch of facts and data. It's about telling right. the stories of people who were affected by those things. Having people in Baltimore have the chance to tell their stories, creating what, I, you know, for lack of a better term, I don't love the term, but it's what they did in South Africa, truth and reconciliation 
Reconciliation Commissions where people had to come and actually confront the truth of what apartheid had done. Uh, there had been efforts to do that in Rwanda and Northern Ireland as well as in South Africa and a few other places around the globe. And I think that if we were to do that, because we just don't do that, we haven't had truth and I don't like the term reconciliation, I'd rather call it truth and justice or something, but we don't have truth or justice, and we don't have justice because we haven't told the truth. And I believe in part, getting people to understand this history is critical, because once again, like I said at the very outset, if you don't know the predicate to what you're seeing, nothing that you're seeing will make sense to you anymore, right? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. You bet. Uh, well, welcome to Houston. Thank you, uh, Thank Dr. You. Robertson, Center I know for Critical This is definitely a sign we're in a, we're in a crunch, but gonna, let's, let's go. No, now? go ahead, please. I, I'll, I'll happily take it, as long as you'll you let, want me. You let me. I'll be quick, I swear, I'll be quick, go. Okay, yeah. just uh, what, what hope do you have for some new alliances right now? Because there's a lot of new people coming out to the streets. Yeah. It's exciting. I'm also a little concerned about some of the divide and conquer yeah. strategies that you know, yeah. people in power may use. Here in Houston, the, the, uh, the police chief recently said, thankfully Houston has a long history of great relationships with activists, but there's a few people that are yeah. kind of anarchists, so, so don't, don't yeah. work with them. And, right. and anarchy basically means that you will, for example, uh, not always have the cell phone of the police chief like on your cell phone, right, where there's different tactics that you're going to use. Yeah, yeah. So I see this potential for unity, but also division. I'm right. wondering what hope do you see for, for creating some unity in the Well, I think we have to recognize that people have different roles to play, different communities will have different roles to play, different people will play different roles. I do think it's really important as we, as we move forward that all of this work, we need to build this intersectional analysis because I am very worried. My primary fear is not the divide between anarchists and everybody else. That, that that's to me, is the least important of the concerns. Um, you know, if that's all we have to worry about, we're going to win this thing. Like that, if that's it, we got it. You know, I'm more concerned about about um, the divide between um, white women who were disproportionately represented at the marches, for instance, around the country a week and a half ago or two weeks, whatever it was, um, and women of color who were forced to remind them on the mall in D.C. that most of their sisters voted for Donald Trump. Right, and so let's not get carried away with our hats, and let's not get carried away with our with our slogans, and let's not get carried away with the Gloria Steinem speech. Like, let's you know, let's really wonder about whether we're really embedding an intersectional analysis into the work. And I don't mean to criticize Gloria because she is increasingly bringing in intersectional stuff because of the influence of women of color on her, thankfully. But um, she didn't think of that herself. That was that was very much part of a movement and a struggle, right? That that she is part of. Um, but I think that, that that's my main concern. My main concern is the folks who, who want to focus on this issue and this silo, and then these people are working on this issue and this silo, and these people are working on this issue and this silo. And we've seen too often progressive movements sacrifice people of color on the altar of expedience. So whether that is the reproductive rights movement that decides, well, we'll sacrifice the government funding part because, you know, we got to get uh, reproductive freedom protected for women at least who can afford it, but we're not really going to fight for access and government funding and and, and oh no, we can't do that. So they get sacrificed. Poor women and women of color get sacrificed. Or or a movement for um, you know a movement for better access for jobs for women, um, you know, and, and, and access to the workplace, which is great, but you know, black and brown women have always been in the workplace. Black and brown women have been working outside the home for a really long time, so if white feminism was primarily fighting for the right of, of, of women to no longer suffer under domesticity, uh, you know, black and brown women weren't just dealing with domesticity, they were dealing with working for other people often in their homes, so that feminism didn't speak to their needs. So I think my concern is just that we're gonna go back to the silos, or that we're going to have some of these new people come in and they're all excited about this kind of demonstration but they're not down for the Black Lives Matter demonstration that'll happen next month when something goes sideways with the cops or they won't be there for the dreamers and they won't be there for the immigration stuff and they won't be at the airport fighting for the rights of refugees you know the way that they were in DC and I'm not saying that's guaranteed I feel like we can get it together I'm just saying to me that's the main concern and what we're gonna have to do is start getting to know one another we've got all these activists who do their own thing in their own community we've got to create some opportunity for folks to actually come together talk about the stuff that they work on and how those things relate because one of the lessons that we learned in the 90s um, when I was doing work in public housing and doing we were working against welfare reform because we thought it was and we've now it's been proven was incredibly punitive when the economy went south it was not as destructive when the economy was relatively healthy but as soon as it went down as we knew it would it became very punitive and lots of folks found themselves suffering um, and one of the things that we learned right was you can't just you can't just talk about poverty in the abstract, you have to talk about the racialized component of, of welfare reform because it was targeted at people of color. You have to talk about the sexist element of welfare reform because it was targeted at women. And the one thing that we didn't do, that, that we didn't think of at the time, 
we should have been talking about the heterosexist nature of welfare reform, because if you think about what was the right wing saying the solution was for these poor women, find a man, right? That was their, that was their chosen solution. Just find a man, get married, you won't need the state. Well, first of all, that assumes hetero, first of all, it assumes that heterosexual poor women of color hadn't thought about finding a man before. Like, it, it, it sort of assumes like, oh, I never thought of that. Thank you for telling me, Newt Gingrich, that that's what I needed to do. But it also, it also assumes heteronormativity, which which if I'm a black woman who's not heterosexual, that does not have any appeal to me to go find a quote unquote man. So if think about what would have happened if we had talked about it that way. We could have had the LGBTQ community on board fighting welfare reform. That would have been a whole new constituency. And by now we would have over 20 years of coalition building across those lines rather than sometimes the silo stuff that's LGBTQ stuff over here which is white identified, even though there are plenty of LGBTQ folk of color who feel left out of that movement, right? The whole way in which the LGBTQ liberation movement has been constructed is white and middle class. Even though the people who threw the bricks and threw the bottles and threw the shoes at Stonewall were primarily trans folk of color and poor working class white folks on the streets of New York City, it wasn't middle class folks. It wasn't upper middle class and affluent white people on the east side. It was poor kids in, in downtown in the village. And so, but that's been erased. And if we had been talking about those connections 20 years ago on, on some issues of joint concern, we'd be further along. So we need to do that now. We need to be very clear about what that looks like now, right? And, and I think if we do that, then we stand a chance. Thank you. One more real quick, I guess. I'll, I'll, take, I'll take as you, you, You're making me nervous. I swear I'll be quicker. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Um, I, I grew up in Houston. I went to a very white school. Uh -huh. um, and now I teach down the street at a school that's very not white. Mm -hmm. um, and I coach debate as well. Um, and my question is how or is it even possible to um, raise consciousness of white supremacy in a school system that is tremendously segregated still to this day? I think it's easier than anywhere else to do it in such a space, maybe. I mean, if the system is incredibly segregated or, or you see that kind of disparity, the fundamental question is always to ask why and it's to get your students to ask why. These things didn't just happen. You know, there was a period of time when schools throughout the South were moving toward greater levels of integration. That was in the 70s and the early 80s and then the courts declared unitary status, allowed all these school systems out from under deseg orders, and then we resegregated. Why? Because nobody was watching the, 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 the barn door anymore. And so, you know, the horses escaped or whatever the proper metaphor is. And so in a sense, um, I think we have to ask, how did it happen? It, 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 it happened because we stopped paying attention. It happened because the system was constructed for segregation. And we just had this brief shining moment of an attempt to have a greater and more desegregated uh, reality, but, but it didn't last because we didn't have the structures in place to ensure that it would last. Um, I think that the thing that young people know, and, and sometimes they won't tell us because they don't know that we know, particularly if it's young kids of color, um, I, you know, James Baldwin, I always come back to Baldwin on virtually everything, as you can notice, but Baldwin said, you know, the thing about it, white folks need to know is that black folks will not tell you the truth. And I think, and, and he didn't mean that as a criticism of black people or people of color generally. He was just saying, like, we're not going to tell you the truth. The reason being, you can't handle the truth. You don't really want to hear it. We're not going to waste our time telling you stuff you're not ready to hear. But when I have gone into schools that were mostly people of color or, or, or groups of, that were mostly youth of color who feel very disaffected from this system and educational system and everything else, and I tell them the stuff they already know, right? I mean, they know the system is a game. They know it's a, they know it's a con. They know it's stacked against them. But they've never had a person in a position of authority look them in the eye and tell them that. They never had a white man in particular look him in the eye and say, yeah, all that shit you think is happening is actually happening, so let's figure out how to bring it down. And the minute that you do that, I mean, the minute, seriously, the first time you do it, I had a friend who started teaching. I grew up with her, went to high school together, graduated together, uh, hadn't talked to her in years. She hits me up on Facebook. She's 40 years old. I'm 40 years old. She's getting ready to start teaching for the first time. She's from Nashville, blonde hair, blue-eyed, former cheerleader. I'm not telling you this in any negative way. I'm just trying to set the picture. I ask her, where are you going to be teaching? Because she knew she was in New York City. She said, I went to Hunter College. I got my teacher certification. I'm going to be teaching in the New York public schools. I said, where? She said, the South Bronx. I said, oh. I said, what neighborhood in the South Bronx? She said, Mott Haven. I said, oh, because if you know anything about the South Bronx, you know Mott Haven is probably the poorest neighborhood in the South Bronx. Median household income in the mid-1990s to late 1990s was $7,200 a year per household per year. So here's this woman who has never taught before. Understand, blonde, blue eyes, former cheerleader, southern accent from Nashville, Tennessee, going into Mott Haven to teach like ninth grade. No, eighth grade, even worse, right? The worst time to be alive. The worst time to be alive, seventh or eighth grade. She's going to be teaching eighth grade. She's never been in a classroom. She said, what do I need to know? 
I said, well, you need a transit map, because I'm guessing you've never been to the South Bronx before. And she said, no, I haven't. I said, what else do I need to know? I said, well, I think Hunter probably taught you a lot, because they, they do prep people pretty well for the New York schools. But I said, here's the thing I would do. Seriously, you got to go in on day one. You just need to go in, because this is the thing. The kids are going to know more about you the minute you walk in than you know about them, no matter how much you study. So you just need to walk in the class, put your name on the board, turn around, look at them, and go, I know this is some shit, right? <laughs> Like, this is crazy, right? Like, this makes no damn sense at all, yes? And then they'll laugh, they'll think it's funny because you're being self-deprecating, and then you need to go, here's the thing. Uh, we have a curriculum we're supposed to follow, and we're going to get to it, but I just want to spend the first day with y'all asking you one fundamental question. I want to hear what you have to say about it. question is this. What do you think it says about how the New York City public school system views you that they would, and how they view me, that they would send me a completely untested novice teacher in to teach you. What do you think it says about how they view you? And what do you think it says about how they view me? Because let's be honest, the kids are going to know immediately what it says. It's going to say that they don't give a damn about whether those kids learn. Because if they cared about what the kids learn, they would send them the most experienced teachers with the most seniority, with the most proven track record of taking kids like that and making them A students. But instead, they sent the young woman who hadn't, is a second career, just got out of school, doesn't know what she's doing because they don't care if they learn and they don't care if she teaches. If she gets burned out and quits, they will find another sucker from Hunter to take her place. I said, here's the thing. The kids will all know that, but they need to know that you know that. So if you ask the question and say, what do you think it says? Discuss. I promise you, they will come up with the exact answer that you and I both know they will have. And then you can say to them, now, what does that mean? It means that we're both being punked. We're both being suckered by a system that doesn't care about either of us. Let's figure out what that means and what we do about it. Now they're going to know that you have thrown down with them on their side, that you're not there to oppress or marginalize or to judge them, that you're there to be an, an ally in solidarity with the cause of their liberation. It doesn't mean you won't have challenges. They are in eighth grade after all. But I promise you, you will forge relationships with them that other teachers will not. And sure enough, she did it. And, you know, she's not teaching now. She taught for five years, which is more than most do when they come into those kinds of schools. But she did forge those kind of relationships because she was honest. And I think that brutal honesty is what young people are looking for. Yes, real quick. Caitlin or Bruce Jenner. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, um, I'll put him next to um, Brandy because both of them kind of had these manslaughter, um, vehicular manslaughter mm -hmm. incidents right. that happened. Right, right. But instead of Bruce dealing with it, he tagged his um, white privilege onto, and this is just me looking at it, he right. tagged his white privilege onto, um, well, okay, I'll be transgendered now, and I'm going to jump onto this community because I have the notoriety, I have the money, and well, I have the privilege for me to be able well, to. Well, let's be clear. Caitlin uh -huh. has been trans all of Caitlin's life. I and mean, let's be very clear. It wasn't a, nobody decides to become trans in a transphobic society just for shits and giggles or fame and money because, indeed, um, it is a very hard thing to come out as trans. And everyone who knew Caitlin when Caitlin went by Bruce, including uh, Caitlin's first wife and, and people in the family and people who knew Caitlin as Bruce, um, knew that there were struggles that she was having even in those days so that that it's certainly not a, a contrivance or a last minute thing and as someone who knows and is close close friends with a number of trans people they all have that same story it's not a last minute decision it's not a jumping on a bandwagon thing um, because it, it is something that they have all felt um, for a very long time that there is a there is an inconsistency between their assigned gender and their actual gender, their biological sex at birth and their actual gender identity. Um, and so first, that's, I think, important and worth saying. Now, your point about the privilege regarding the vehicular homicide is totally true, but keep in mind, Caitlin was already Caitlin when that happened. It's not like she was going by Bruce, that happened, and decided to be trans, as if that would help her in the criminal justice system. It certainly would not. Um, uh, Caitlin was the beneficiary both of white privilege in that situation and also, of course, course, uh, class privilege, um, because in most instances, in cases of vehicular homicide, both of those things are going to work for you. The whiteness piece certainly had a lot to do with it, as I'm sure the celebrity piece did. Um, you know, a number of other things were going on there uh, with that case. So there's no doubt that there was privilege embedded in it. Now, as for the um, part about uh, LGBTQ movement identifying um, with the civil rights movement uh, um, for reasons that maybe are not kosher or maybe not um, 
legit. I would say, to me, the bigger problem is the LGBTQ community doesn't, I, the white LGBTQ community, let's be clear, does not identify sufficiently with the civil rights movement and does not identify sufficiently with the anti-racist movement, which is why the white LGBTQ movement, and I want to say that there's a larger movement that has always involved peoples of color, that always involved LGBTQ folks of color. James Baldwin was indeed a gay man. Audre Lorde was, was, was you know, a, a lesbian woman. So there are people who have always been in the community who were of color and who were quote unquote queer, right? Um, however, the movement has been constructed as white and the movement was constructed as white and upper middle class, excluding not just people of color, but also working class. There are working class, you know, white folks in farm communities in Iowa that don't have access to a, a movement or a community the same way that other folks do. And so they're left out as well. They're not represented in the gay and lesbian media. They're not represented in the sort of constructed fiction of fabulousness that, that Bravo sells us or whatever, or that Out Magazine sells us or that The Advocate sells us. Um, so there's a whole lot that's wrong with that. I think the biggest problem within the white contingent of the LGBTQ community is that it has not sufficiently understood the anti-racism struggle. They only use it in the sense that, you know, it's a very identifiable struggle for, for justice and liberation. I think it makes sense that you would point to that and some of the strategies as something that's very inspiring and uplifting. And to the extent that both gender identity and sexual orientation are in fact immutable characteristics. Whether one considers them to be biological and genetic or in some other way intangibly immutable, they are not chosen. Um, you know, no one in this room chose to be heterosexual or cisgendered. You either are heterosexual and or cisgendered or you are not. And the same is true with LGBTQ folks. So in a sense, even though you can't necessarily tell who is gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgendered, or, or in any other way gender queer by looking at them, um, they should certainly have the right to be in possession of their full self and to tell you that without fear of being uh, fired, of being denied housing, of being denied the right to get married, of being denied the right to adopt, of being denied the right to whatever the, the right may be. And so whether or not, I mean, one can't necessarily look at me and know that I'm Jewish, but I should be able to be openly Jewish without having to worry that someone is going to come along and try to put me in, in, in a camp or, uh, you know, whatever. Or, um, you know, I, or I can be Muslim and not necessarily identifiably so, and I should still be able to be so. I shouldn't have to stop covering my head if I'm a Muslim woman because somebody, I'm afraid, you know, I could do that and then I could potentially hide if I'm not covering. I could, I could, I could pretend that I'm not Muslim, but I shouldn't have to do that. Um, and the same is true with sexual orientation or gender identity. So um, I think the, the one thing I, I do, however, uh, definitely agree with you about, there have certainly been elements of the white LGBTQ community who have, I think, misappropriated certain concepts and terminology from the struggle against racism. Um, and done so in a way that makes them seem separate struggles when in fact they are intersectional. Best example, when Prop 8 was, was uh, passed in California, right, um, there was a big campaign, No on 8, um, and of course this was uh, something that passed several years ago against marriage equality, and um, and, and the wake of that, Advocate Magazine had a big headline on the magazine. This is the sort of preeminent LGBTQ publication in the mainstream uh, LGBTQ press. Uh, and the headline said, you know, uh, gay is the new black or something like that, right? Which is just a horribly offensive mm -hmm. comment for two reasons. Number one, it assumes that gay can't also be black, right? So what if I'm gay and black? Like, what, what do I do now? You just said gay is the new black. Hell, I'm the old black and, <laughs> and, and the old gay. So like how, like how, you know, so you just left me out entirely. But the other problem it's offensive is because it, it uh, you know, for the obvious reason is that it assumes that black oppression or anti-black oppression doesn't happen anymore. That, you know, that, that, that we've been taking care of that, but now this is the thing. When in fact, both are the thing. When in fact, LGBTQ folks of color are some of the most marginalized people in this country. It's trans women of color who are disproportionately the victims of police violence, more so than maybe any other subgroup. It's trans women and men of color who are disproportionately relative to population, the victims of hate crime activity. It's trans women of color who, you know, who who are brutalized in jails and prisons, both local and state and federal, perhaps more so than any other community. So, so the danger in the way that the LGBTQ liberation movement has been constructed by white upper middle class 
activist is that it marginalizes the voices of peoples of color, makes it seem as if that movement is separate and apart from the struggle against racism rather than deeply embedded in it. That to me is the offensive part. Not that they would say, hey, we ought to learn something from the civil rights movement. That to me seems to be a very good thing to do. Learn something from the civil rights movement. Absolutely talk about the strategies and, the, and, and what would work and what wouldn't work and what can you learn and what can you take away from it. Same thing with the labor movement. Same thing with the, you know, quote unquote women's movement in its, in its like traditional uh, initial iteration. Same thing with the movement against child labor. There are all of these things that we can learn from. The question is, are we really learning from them? Uh, and some I think do, and some do not. And, 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 and so the question is, how do we make that movement intersectional, but at the same time, how do we make the struggle against white supremacy intersectional? Because too often we do not, and historically what we have done is we have said, you know, well, the struggle against racism, you know, is, well, you know, you're, you know, that they're, you're, you know, are, are, we, are we standing up as black people or are we standing up as women, as if somehow women are not also black? Are we standing up for black people or are we standing up for LGBTQ folks as if LGBTQ folks are not also black? When we end up prioritizing the voices of heterosexual and cisgendered men, uh, whether that's in the labor movement, broadly racially constructed, or whether that's in the black or brown community, we reinforce the domination and the subordination of black and brown women. We reinforce the domination and subordination of black and brown children. We, dom we reinforce the domination and subordination of black LGBTQ folks, non-Christians, etc. Um, and so all of these movements have to learn from one another. I think the LGBTQ movement has a lot to learn from the civil rights struggle. The civil rights struggle, the ongoing uh, traditional anti-racism and civil rights struggle has a lot to learn from the, the uh, black feminist and has a lot to learn from the LGBTQ struggle as well, but as well as the struggle against Islamophobia. One so thing, but in negative. learning that, is it actually learning the lesson or is it, a, is it appropriation? Because a lot of times it can just be misconstrued as appropriation and abuse of... Oh, of course. I, and it all depends on, I mean, obviously, you know, whether we really learn the lesson is whether the lesson's really taught. I mean, you know, there are a lot of lessons we've been taught that are incorrect in our history. And so if I've been taught an incorrect or incomplete history, if I've been taught that Stonewall was something that was done mostly by white people who were cisgendered as opposed to trans women of color and, and white homeless youth in the village, then I'm going to have a constructed view of the struggle as being this middle class thing as opposed to a fundamentally working class and of color and trans led movement, which also then leads to transphobia among among gay and lesbian and bisexual people who, you know, there's significant transphobia in the LGB part of that community as well that they struggle with. So, so clearly something can be appropriation if it's not done properly. The question is, would we prefer the LGBTQ community not to really learn the lessons and truly internalize the lessons of the black freedom struggle and, and therefore not build on that and not connect to that um, because they wouldn't want to maybe make a mistake and, and, and do it wrong? Or would we rather them learn to do it right? I would rather that folks learn to do it right by building those connections, by realizing that these two struggles are in fact linked, and by not trying to do this sort of silo thing where we say the black struggle is over here and the LGBTQ struggle is over here because then that forces black folks who are LGBTQ who are just as percentage wise likely to be so as white folks to decide they have to choose which of these struggles to be a part of and that's incredibly unhealthy for such a person to have to decide am I going to throw down with this or I'm going to throw down with that when in fact both are important and have to be linked and connected so thank you so much appreciate it. I'm sorry uh, for cutting off our conversation but we have come to the end of our hour together and we want to sincerely thank you uh, thank you for your engaging questions. Truly, there's a lot for us to discuss. There's a lot of our world we still need to change. There's a lot of our, our reality that we still need to make better. And that is why we are here today and why I want to sincerely thank you. The other reason is I have some caterers out there who have a whole bunch of food that i got to get rid of, right, tonight. And so I need for you, in just a second, to go out and consume yourself with as much food as <laughs> we can squeeze out of the provost, right? <laughs> so, on behalf of the Center for Critical Race Studies, please stand and give a warm round of applause for <laughs> and selling books right outside, as well as, like I said, there's a whole buffet of food that I need for you literally to devour before you go home tonight. Thank you so much for being here, and have a beautiful, beautiful night.